Oops, sorry. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Katie of Greenland Quilter, and today we're going to have a little fun. So I uh, basically, um, I have a guest. His name is Eric of uh, uh, Treasures, Treasure Heart Creations. I'll get that right. <laughs> Are you still there with me, Eric? Hello. Uh-oh. I lost him. Hi, Tess. Uh, Eric, I, hopefully he'll be right back. He disappeared. So anyway, welcome to the channel. I hope everybody's having a great day. Hi, Tessa. Hi, Linda. Uh, Eric will be back in a couple seconds. I think he got disconnected or something. So hopefully he'll be right back. How is everybody today that's come in the channel so far? Tell me what you've been doing today, um, where you're viewing from, and whatever else you want to share. I'll be happy to read it. Uh, I think he must have had a connection problem or something. I don't know exactly what happened to him. He'll be right back, hopefully. Hi, Sylvia. I've been looking forward to sewing with him all this time, and he was just here, but something must have happened to him, so... Uh, hopefully, he'll be right back. There he is, I think. Nope. Okay. So while we're waiting on him to come back, um, I have some housekeeping I need to talk to y'all about. And then we will get... Hey, welcome back, Eric. Anyhow, everybody, welcome Eric to the live today. He, he has a channel called Treasure Hearts Created. <laughs> Brain fart. Sorry. <laughs> you can tell him your channel. <laughs> Can't hear you. Uh-oh, no voice. Hi, Chloe, and hello, Sylvia, and Lori. Hello. Uh, we're having a little bit of a technical problem, looks like, so Eric's trying to figure it out. So in the meantime, while he's working on that, I'm, I'll am i go ahead and get some housekeeping out of the way that I wanted to talk to you all about. Hey, Robin? Still nothing, Eric? All right, so anyway. I wanted to remind everybody, starting on April 27th, we are going to start the So Long Raspberry Kiss Kisses. Um, I will be posting a pre uh, preview so of one of the blocks sometime in the next two or three days. And um, it's your decision on how much yardage you plan on using. And um, yeah, I'm going to share with you the fabric I'm using for it while we're waiting on Eric. But in the meantime, I wanted y'all to know about some upcoming lives. I have an upcoming live on April 23rd, and it's a sew and chat with Lil Wayne of, y'all know who Lil Wayne is. On the April 24th, I have a sew and chat with Karen of Just Get Her Done or Get It Done. On April 25th, I have a sew and chat with Liana of uh, Pastry Queen. On May the 4th, I have a chat with another designer of the Stronger Together 2024. Her name is Cherise. She will be coming to sew and chat with us. And on May the 16th, I have a sew and chat scheduled with Russ of Quilts Meet, Quilts Meet World. And at the end of the month, I will be doing uh, posting two pre-recorded videos. One will be of uh, what I accomplished for April. And the other one, the separate one, will be of what I accomplished on the first quarter of the year, which means it's January, February, March, and April. I'll be showing y'all what I've done, what I've finished, what I haven't finished. Um, 
probably mention more about the trip that I made to the U.S., which slowed things gone. I know, Robin. He'll be back. He's trying to work on technology. Okay, so hello, Jean, and hello, Robin. So those are the housekeeping, and I will be posting. Uh, I just haven't figured out how I'm going to make the schedule. I'll probably, probably create like a calendar or something thing and then turn it into a graphic and then post it on the um, community tab and also in um, my Greenland Quilter Facebook group. So stay tuned in the next three or four days for that so you'll know what's going to be happening. I also have a sew with Becca. I don't know why that's not on this list. Hold on. Let me tell you what the day of that's going to be. Becca's going to come sew and chat with me as well. And that is scheduled for hang on a minute while I look it up real quick sorry I don't know how I missed that uh, Becca's going to be sewing with me on May the 11th I believe but let me make sure before y'all write if you're writing this down but like I said I'll be posting all this information in the community chat as well yes May the 11th I will be sewing with Becca okay so um, while we're having guests on the Saturdays, um, we will still continue on with, you know, we'll do on the 27th, we will discuss, um, we may make some blocks that day. We'll see. So here's what I need you guys to do. If you're going to do the Raspberry Kiss um, and you haven't downloaded this pattern, you'll find the pattern over on my community tab, and I also posted it in my Greenlink Quilter Facebook group. And Eric's back, so we're waiting on him to finish loading up. And um, that way you can be prepared to sew with me on the 27th while we have a guest. Well, actually, I don't have a guest scheduled for that day, so it could be that it, um, it could be it's just me sewing. Katie, can you remind me how much background you recommended for the sew log? I would say to two to two and a half yards depending on the size you're going to make because the the downside to this free pattern is it doesn't show anywhere how much yardage for the background so i'm just going to guess and say two and a half yards it may be more when i start cutting the block i'll be able to hopefully figure that out when i start cutting strips because uh here is a picture of um the block before you even start sewing it and it has all the measurements on it so hopefully when i start cutting the background um i'll be out how much yardage you need welcome back eric do you have a voice yes i do hopefully you can hear me now <laughs> yep we can hear you so Sorry. everybody say hello to eric he's back hopefully our technology will be okay now um as i said he's going to talk about his channel um yeah tell him about your channel tell us how you started um what's your favorite thing that you love to sew the most i think i kind of know what it is but let's see what you say and in the channel all of y'all guess what do you think eric's most favorite item that he likes to make the most of or what he enjoys making the most and let's see who can guess what eric loves making and then Eric can say, yes, that's it, or no, that's not it. So, yeah. Okay. So go ahead and talk to the channel for a bit. Okay. Hello. Um, first of all, first and foremost, thank you, Katie, for inviting me on here. Uh, I know we had a little bit of an obstacle being that my work schedule got in the way, but we, we are here. Uh, my name is Eric, and my channel is called, and this always trips up everybody, Treasure Heart Creations. <laughs> <laughs> so um let's see more about me i was born and raised in honolulu hawaii but i've been living here in los angeles for the past oh 15 years or so and i'm looking forward to making a big move in the coming months so i'm going to be saying goodbye to los angeles and hello to i don't know where yet but hello to someplace new um I started sewing, or actually, I started quilting about, oh gosh, how long has it been? I want to say almost 10 years ago. Um, and for those of you that 
that do follow the channel. I did tell this story once, but I'll tell it for everybody here. Um, I actually got started quilting in a very, very, uh, shall I say, funny <laughs> way, because, <clears throat> sorry, originally I wanted to, um, I wanted to do fashion design, in particular, learn how to sew my own clothes. And reason for that is because, well, I stand six feet, six inches tall. And being here in the land of Hollywood, if you're not a size zero, you're not really relevant. So it was very difficult for me to find clothes here. And even the big and tall shops, they get the, uh, they get the big aspect, but they don't get the tall aspect. So a lot of the pants that I would buy here or that I would find locally, um, they were, the inseam was a little too short, actually a whole foot short in a lot of cases. So I would just look really weird. And I figured, well, you know what, let me just learn how to make my own pants. And I started looking around for sewing classes. Unfortunately, most of the sewing classes were during the day. So that just kind of like, left me with very limited choices. And I figured, you know, I learned how to do so many other things on YouTube. Let's just try and figure out or see if there's uh, sewing tutorials on YouTube. And so I typed in on YouTube sewing tutorial and up comes this very, very rambunctious lady by the name of Jenny Dome. And I figured, well, quilting is sewing. So if I learn how to make a quilt, I'm learning how to sew. So I just started watching Missouri Star Quilt Company tutorials and kind of made my first quilt based on what I was learning from Jenny and never looked back. So I started quilting. That was about 10 years ago and just never looked back. So, yeah, that's that was a brief introduction into how I started quilting. Of course, I don't only quilt. There's other creative things that I do, such as um, sometimes I'll dabble in uh, paper paper projects like card making. Um, I will do I will do, especially around the holidays, a couple of Christmas wreaths or any kind of holiday theme wreaths for your door, gift baskets, baking. Um, I'm what do you what do they say? The crafter of all trades, but the expert of none. So. I just like to <laughs> experiment with a lot of different things. So that's a kind of quick history about me. Um, and the other common question that I do often get is how did I come up with the channel name? Because it is something, <laughs> as most people have experienced, something hard to remember, but um, there is a story behind it. It's based upon a writing um, for those that don't know, I am a practicing Buddhist, and in one of the scriptures, they talk about the valuables or the intangibles in one's life. You know, when there's people who have material wealth, and there's people that have those type of a wealth that is not tangible or it's not measurable. And you might think that the wealthiest person in the world is the one who has the most money, but in reality, they could be the most unhappy person in the world. So one of the scriptures in Buddhism says that there's what they call the treasures of the storehouse, which is all of your material wealth. Then there's the treasures of the body, which is your physical health. Then there's treasures of the heart, which is all of those intangible things. So even if you are the wealthiest person in the world, you might not have a lot of friends. You might not have family around. You might not have um, you might not have happiness around in your life, and so those are the things that we call the treasures of the heart. What's interesting in, about what the Buddhist scripture says is that you can, um, when you pass away or move on to your next existence, the material wealth and all of that doesn't get carried forward onto your next existence, but the, the treasures of your heart, all of those relationships that you forge, all of those intangible things in your life, those are the things that you carry with you. And those are the things that people will remember you by. And so 
uh, when I was thinking about a channel name, I kind of thought about what is the core value that I want to express in this channel. And as quilters, you know, when we gift a quilt, they often say that it's like giving a hug to someone. And so I believe that when you make a gift from with your own two hands or from scratch, you know, a part of you goes into that gift, whether you realize it or not. It's all of your blood, sweat, and your tears and your hard work that goes into there. And so that's sort of like, oh, in a way, giving a piece of your heart to that person. And we often say that if someone is not quilt-worthy, then just make it quickly. But if they are quilt-worthy, you'll take the time to put a lot of care and a lot of love into what you're creating. And so I kind of thought that during the pandemic, so many of us were stuck at home. And what I kind of saw was that a lot of people just didn't have a lot of love um, around them. They just felt isolated. And so that's when I decided I made the decision to start this channel and I called it Treasure Heart Creations. So kind of a long-winded story to <laughs> a lot of questions that I get. So that's me. Um, I'll do a lot of quilting videos, but I also do dabble in some other projects, usually on a live. Um, if I'm making something, I'll just say, hey, let's turn on the camera and let's go live. So you'll find a very eclectic mix of crafting, quilting, sewing related projects that I do. So that's me in a nutshell, <laughs> a big nutshell. What is the, what is the um, project that you're working on? So this was, the quote behind me was actually started off as, um, I made a block using strings. Because I, whenever I just want to sew something or just kind of do some mindless sewing, I always make string blocks or some kind of crumb block. And <clears throat> I accumulated a, a large stack of these things. And so I wanted to experiment with um, what can I use them for instead of just making a regular string quilt. I started experimenting with it and kind of asked the question, can I do like a traditional block using string blocks? And so that's when I started experimenting with uh, certain things. And I made this turn dash quilt behind me. Um, kind of surprised with how it turned out. But it was also a, an experiment in trying to mix different colors, see what color combinations match and which ones I just really don't like. And so that, um, yeah, I was kind of interested in just experimenting with it, just playing around with scraps um, and then just seeing what, what my imagination can or where, where my imagination will take me. So that's kind of where this quilt came about. Um, still not finished because I'm still trying to decide what kind of borders I want to put around it. But for the most part, yeah, this is it. <laughs> well, it's beautiful. I love how it looks. Thank you. So the question I asked in the channel was, um, what do you think Eric's favorite thing to make is? And I've got a <laughs> few answers. So here's the list of things that they mentioned that they think you love doing the most. The heart block. String blocks, crumb blocks, scrappy blocks, curve blocks, superheroes, fabric balls, Christmas ornaments, card making. So which one out of that list do you love doing the most? Oh, gosh. Do I only have to pick one? <laughs> no, you can pick more than one if you want. Um, I do like making string blocks simply because it's a good time to just kind of decompress after a very complicating or maybe a very frustrating day. Um, and so string blocks kind of get me back centered just so it, because I can just do some mindless sewing and don't have to think about exact measurements or worry about if my points match. Um, yeah. So that's one. But my favorite thing to actually sew is a log cabin. And I haven't done that on the channel, but I'm kind of thinking about doing like a whole log cabin series. So oh, that sounds like fun. Yeah. And I do like, especially around the holidays, this is when I put all of the sewing projects aside. <clears throat> Sorry. And I will venture out and do other crafts. Um, 
people have seen me making ornaments. People have seen me making gift baskets on the channel. I've done some, probably going to maybe experiment with some baking during the holidays too. So yeah, I like a whole lot of things, but can't really call one thing my favorite. I um was it when I was doing my um shop hopping with my husband. Um, what the first shop that I visited that was before I picked him up from the airport three days later was the shop called it's called the Art Fabric Shop in Lake City, Florida. And they, I, I think it's called Kimmy Coney Balls, something mm -hmm. like that. Yep. Um, she had a whole display on them, and I made a um. YouTube short about them, but they're also on a, a longer video as well that I created a, a northeastern um, uh, region of just those shops. I still have more to edit and get up for the rest of them we got done. But I thought of you the minute I saw them because I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh, he would love some of these that I saw because some of them were quite beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I did actually. I did see that video, um, and some—I mean, some of these aren't. Some of those ornaments can get very, very elaborate, and some of yep. them can get very basic. But even the basic ornaments, you know, depending upon the material that you use and your own creativity, they can be very, very beautiful and very extravagant. Um, I've Apparently, seen they must be a—they must be a thing because. Uh that you saw in the video where some of them were hanging on little stands and others were yep. sitting on little stands. So it must be a, a crafting thing that a lot of people do. Yeah, it is actually. There's one person that, uh, there's actually a couple of YouTubers that I know of that their whole channel is just doing nothing but that. And they get very creative with the types of materials that they use because they don't only use fabric, they will use sequins, they will use beads, they will use uh, paper. Um, and it just, it's kind of like, just let your creativity, let it go and see where it takes you kind of thing. So I got inspired, well, I actually learned that particular ornament from my grandmother because she used to make a lot of the traditional style, which is what you saw at the shop. Yep. And, and um, it was years ago before I finally picked it up again, because for a long time, I just didn't craft. I didn't, I didn't do anything kind of creative. And right around the time when I started quilting, I kind of realized that, hey, I, have, I need some kind of creative outlet before I start to explode <laughs> and just go yep. crazy. So, yeah, that's when I started exploring that side of me again. Well, that's awesome. So I asked everybody in the channel what they're working on, and this is what some of the answers we got. I'm reorganizing at the moment. That's from Jean. Chloe says my April mug of the month. It's one and a half inch half squares, but the one and a half inch half squares triangles are giving her trouble. <laughs> Luane said he just finished Clue 9 of Carnival. Which colorway, Luane? In Quilt Fix. Hi, Katie and Eric just popped in for a few minutes. Kathy says wise words when you were talking about uh, parts of your channel. Mm -hmm. um, uh oh, I lost something. Hang on a minute. Okay, Tessa says, love the story about your channel name. I never heard you talk about it before. And then Chloe says to Luane, you are ready for the reveal. Samantha says, hey, Katie, I researched my tension problems on my new long arm. Ugh. That's what she's working <laughs> on. Jean says, really enjoyed hearing the background of the meaning behind your channel name, Eric. Thanks for sharing. There's Hello to anyone else that just came in. Uh, Rena says she thinks the log cabin series would be wonderful. Sylvia says, I am doing the curved log cabin with my scrappy string strips. Oh, God. Uh, Donna Dixon says, I'm doing log cabin blocks now. Uh, <laughs> Samantha, let's see. Samantha, here you're having tension trouble. Robin says, Eric and Tiffany did a video on Christmas ornaments. It was a hoot. Um, <laughs> Robert Cox says, I'm looking to get more into my crafty side also. Hi, Katie. Hi, Robert. 
And Luang says, I am doing the large bomb pop, same colorway as Sean. Oh, it's the same one I'm doing. But his is small. Yep, mine is large. Okay, Um, I was going <laughs> to... All right. So what me and Eric are going to do is... Actually, I would love... Are you going to do string blocks today, or what's your plan? I'm just going to do string blocks again, because I need to replenish the stash that I used up to make that. <laughs> So can you show, I, I will pin you so you can show us, show us how you started out with the interfacing for it, if you don't sure. mind. Let me pin you. So the camera's moving down. That way I have some interfacing, but I've never done one and I might just follow your lead and do that. So in terms of the interfacing or whatever, whatever foundation you use, I'm just using newspaper here. And I find that, that it worked for me, number one, because it's somewhat free because I can just grab it from the office and just bring it home. And I've seen other people use like some much, much more fancier, pricier kind of interfacing. Of course, you can. there's products that you can purchase out there. But for me, I just find that the paper newsprint works fine. And people often ask me, Do, does the ink rub off? It does a little bit, but most of the times, especially in modern times, a lot of companies will, um, they've resolved that issue of having the ink kind of rub off on you. So I don't notice it rubbing off on the fabric. And I understand that's a major concern of a lot of people. Um, but, you know, if you don't have newspaper, you can always use like an, if you have an old telephone book, <laughs> a certain relic from the past. Um, I've seen people use muslin. I've also seen people use, um, if they have a stash of, I don't want to call it ugly fabric, so I call it undesirable fabric, they will cut that into squares and use that as their foundation. But whatever it is, you know, you can cut your foundation, whether it's paper or whether it's muslin, cut it to a size that you want. This, I usually do a six and a half inch square simply because that matches the size ruler that I do have. And you just basically lay one piece down. I always start, um, I always sew these on the diagonal for some reason. Of course, I do see people sewing them just vertically straight up and down. But to me, it adds a little bit of interest when you have it diagonally. You sew, you lay your first piece down. Make sure that your fabric overhangs um, or it's longer than what your foundation is. Then you can go ahead and lay the next piece down right side together. And we're gonna sew a quarter inch down. There. Whoops, gotta turn the machine on first. Do you cut all of them the same length or you just pull out a bunch of scraps and sure you have enough um, that's long enough to go diagonal like that? You know, usually I will cut it down. In reality, I when I when I have a, like this string here, for example, this was cut off when I was trying to square up a fabric or, or a piece of yardage. And I just leave it the length that it is. But as I start using it, I will start cutting it down into smaller segments. So uh, one less step to do. And whenever I sew strings, I always do a bit of chain piecing here. So I got one started on the machine. I'm going to start the next one. And I will just pick a fabric and just start going. All right. Okay, so while we're sewing, I have got to, I think I'm going to try a piece of interfacing for mine, since that's what I have. I don't have any newsprint laying around. Um, so while we're sewing, if any of you have a question you would like to ask Eric, please post it in the channel and I will relay it to him. I'll be right back. Need to unpin this. There we go. Okay. Okay, I think I can do this. Oops.
And also, I'm going to show you guys uh, the fabric uh, that I'm going to use for our sew along. Um, I didn't show. I showed it still in its plastic, but um, now I can. I'm. I've already opened it, and then I'm going to show you the colorways that are in that group. But let me cut this interfacing first so I can join Eric in sewing. Ooh, that iron's too hot. Thanks. Is it stuck to it? So, Eric, what's the weather like your way? It's sunny for now. The weather's been very interesting the past couple of days because yesterday it was very, very cloudy and gray, but now it's cheerful and sunny. <laughs> Go figure that. <laughs> Our weather has been confused. I think. Uh, we've been having rain, snow, and sleet on and off for the last several days. Right now, the sun is out, but there is cloud in the sky. So I'm thinking that we're not off the hook yet with whether the weather makes up its mind. Spring is coming or if it still wants to hang on to old man winter. <laughs> the snow, every time it snows, though, the snow doesn't last very long um, on the ground. It, it's... Everything's a big, blushy mess outside right now. It can prove to be interesting when you have dogs and the dogs walk through the mud like it's nothing. And you're like, oh, God, they're going to drag it all <laughs> in on the house. See, if I were a dog, I wouldn't be sure. Well, I would probably get scolded by my owner for doing that, but I wouldn't care. It would be all worth it for me. <laughs> well, even as a human, I wouldn't care. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's just, uh, I have uh, wood floors, and you can see paw prints when they go do that. Oh, uh, okay. Which is kind of, uh, you know, oh, come on, you guys, why do you to go through the mud? But they love it. <laughs> so they're doing what they love to do. You know, last November was the very first time in my life where I saw and got to play in snow. <laughs> really? Yep. I was venturing out into southwest, no, so, yeah, southwestern Utah. And for the first time, I was driving through a snowstorm and I didn't even realize it was snow, it was a snowstorm. I thought it was just a light sprinkling of snow, but nope, they had the full snow powers and tractors out on the road to move all the snow away. And I got all excited. So I, Jumped out of the car, made my first snow angel for the first time in my life. And people thought I was crazy because it was right on the long side of the major highway. Hey, when you see snow, it's something, especially if you've never seen it. Yep. You know, I I I love when it's when it's snowing outside. You know, when it first starts snowing, and um there's been interesting things I've seen over the last 12 years when it comes to snowfall uh one of the first things i noticed besides you know i was holding my hand out sticking my tongue out the first time you know trying to get a taste you know but <laughs> um <laughs> being silly but one one time it snowed really humongous snowflakes i'm not kidding it was like pieces of flour, uh pieces of paper just floating in the air they were so big the next morning when you go out because those uh, those uh, snowflakes are so big, they trap oxygen molecules in between the flakes when they're on the ground. And right. when you walk outside, sometimes the snow looks like this bluish color. And mm -hmm. I did some research, and basically it happens when the snow is a certain size, the temperature is a certain size, and a lot of it falls at once, like rain, and it'll sometimes trap all these molecules, which causes that bluish color in the snow. So that's fun. Um, I don't like being rained on. I love the rain if I don't have to be in it. But I don't mind being in the snow, which is hilarious. And the dogs are the same way. <laughs> they'll play in the snow. They'll stand in it while it's snowing. But if it's raining, you can forget it. <laughs> They're like, oh, I don't want to go outside. No, no, no. The funny thing is, is both of them love getting in the lake. So I don't know what the deal is about the rain. 
it's pretty comical with them. Okay, let's see what's being said. Are you sewing strips underneath? Yes, Joy, he is. Sylvia says it's 57 degrees and sunny, so easy to be warm outside. Our uh, inside 50, of our house. Wow. Is, <laughs> yeah, the inside of our house right now, the temperature outside is. Let me go see if it's accurate because that says 35 degrees. Be right back. Okay. I'm going to have a quick peek. I'm going to peek outside our door. This one. Oop, that's a little thick, so I'm gonna slice that one down. That looks like it's pretty accurate. So it's 35 degrees, but the inside of our house feels like a sauna. It is so warm in the house. It's like, golly. I just want spring to get here so we can go ahead and uh, I probably will do it right before Nikolai leaves because he's leaving in five days. And I probably will go outside and uh, turn our thermostat down because I can't stand it to be this hot in here. It is really hot. Oh, gosh. How long are you making your, for your um, strips? How long are you making them? Um. I just eyeball it. There's no, there's no no rhyme or reason to it. So I just kind of measure it, make sure it just hangs over the, the foundation a little bit, and then use my scissors to just cut it. Okay. I was curious. Yeah. I'm the type of quilter or kind of creator where the less, less intermediate steps you have to take with measurements and all of that. Mm -hmm. Um. If I can get away with doing without doing things like that, I'm golden. Oh, okay. Well, I love skipping steps too at times, especially if I could find a shortcut to do something. Right. Like with half square triangles, I like to use paper because I can get tons of them done in a matter of hours versus trying to. Because I, I don't like drawing lines. Let's see here. When Wayne says, we have a saying in Texas, if God meant for Texans to ski, he would have made bull crap white. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> that is very funny, Wayne. And sometimes, especially with me, I start to find that the block starts curling upwards. And it's usually because I, I usually sew with a smaller stitch length. And so the tension on the stitches kind of pulls everything together. When that happens, I'll just take it to the iron and make the fibers relax. Looks like I need to do a little cutting here. Mm, okay. And no rhyme, no reason to this. Just find a strip. And if it's, if it's long enough, if it fits, then I just sew it on. <laughs> That's a good good way of doing it yeah and it's always interesting because every time i see like a piece of scrap i can always remember the project that it was with or uh if it was part of a certain quilt i always remember what quilt it was what i struggled with on that quilt who it was for which is in which i like to think that every quilt has its own story Yes, it does. Oh. Or you have a story to tell that happened while you were making it. Yep. 
because there is that factor playing in. Do you use a, uh, Lori wants to know, do you use a dry iron or steam? Luane, mm -hmm. yes, we're still on for Tuesday. Um, mostly dry iron, but if it's a really stubborn or bulky steam, I will steam the crap out of it. And just try and get it as flat as I can. Okay, I'm gonna do some a little modification here on some of these so I can have some thin strips too. Any of this is is I can trim them down however I want to. Yeah. So, Katie, I've been meaning to ask, are there a lot of quilters out in Greenland, or are you pretty much kind of by yourself? Currently, I am by myself. Kind of, it, it, there, you know, I'm sure that there's someone that does quilts, but I have yet to see, see any personally myself. Hmm. It's always interesting to hear about other quilters in other countries. Yeah, you know, it's kind of strange that um, when you go to Denmark and you're looking for quilt shops, it's not an exactly easy task. Because yep. they're strung out, you know, throughout Denmark, but the number of shops is not that many. Uh, and a lot of the shops that I have gone into, they... Their fabric is mostly gener uh how do you put this? Um it's generated more towards people who are making clothes or um mm -hmm. using things like upholstery, you know, other different kind of items like that. And I know there's a quilt guild in Denmark, but when you write to them, they don't answer. Oh. And I find that a bit frustrating as well, because, you know, I would like to have, get to know some fellow quilters on this side of the pond, because, you know, they might have something to share. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a Scandinavian, you know, they may have Scandinavian quilt art, you, you know, you never know. Uh, on one of the Zooms that I was um, posting, we actually had somebody from France. And you would think oh, cool. that you would, I kind of thought that, okay, France, there's a lot of fashion designers, we know that. So maybe there's a lot of quilting fabric. And what she told me is because there's a lot of fashion designers, everything is catered to them, not necessarily the home crafter or the quilter. And so yeah. for her to find fabric, it is a struggle. She's thankful that Missouri Star will ship internationally, but it's very um, costly for her to get anything. So she was able to network herself. And then she did find one particular shop that did have quilting fabric. So she's happy about that. But in terms of the cost of purchasing like a yard of fabric, it is quite costly because of the fact that it has to get shipped there. So yeah. I think while we are here in the U.S. complaining about the fabric prices going up here, then that means it's going up tenfold everywhere else around the world. Yeah, uh, the inflation prices and stuff that everybody in the United States are experiencing is not an American problem. It is yeah. a worldwide problem. And most Americans need to have that understanding instead of, you know, I hear a lot about, and I'll try not to get too political here, to hear a lot of comments about how our leadership can fix that. No, they can't. It not can't. unless they want to rein in all the corporations are still making billions despite the high prices we all pay for their stuff. Because they're the one making all the money off the backs of the, you know, common everyday people, right. the people who are not rich. 
And here in Greenland, um, I'm, I order all of my fabric from the United States, pretty much. Sometimes when I'm in Denmark, I'll go see if I can find anything interesting, you know, that I want to, you know, think about using for quilting. But mm -hmm. um, Greenland has, well, they're not part of the European Union. And because of that, there is there is an action for that, uh, meaning that, you know, you would think, okay, well, you're not part of the European Union. Why would that matter? Well, it matters if you're trying to order things in Europe. <laughs> and if those countries are part of the European Union, and since Greenland is no longer part of the European Union, then those companies don't have to ship to Greenland. So we run into that problem constantly. Of So Legos is a Danish company. Mm -hmm. It's a Danish creator. It's the whole nine yards. That's where Legos come from. They have the manufacturing there, all of it. But can we buy Legos from the Lego dot D, uh, dot, uh, DK and ship to us in Greenland? No. <laughs> they will not ship to Greenland, but yet Greenland is part of the Danish crown, even though it's its own country, it's still not totally autonomous from the Danish crown. So it makes really no sense at all. That's when just politics just works against a common person. Yeah, if you're, if you're not, a, a whatever you call it, that donates money, you're nothing. Yeah, sad to say. And you know, I don't think I. I just find that wrong. I'll be looking at the screen in just a minute, you guys. I had I'm cutting different sizes of strips. Sorry, let me see if I can pull up the chat on my end. Yeah. Nikolai's taking a day off and not participating. <laughs> uh, he's he's getting his mind ready for going back to work too. I don't think he's necessarily ready to go back. But his They'll get to fish for a couple of weeks and then um, they're setting sail for Denmark because the ship has got to go into dry dock. It needs a lot of repairs. So Lori Colgan asked, is there anyone in Eric's family that sews or do other crafts? Um, my mother used to sew. She actually has her own sewing machine, but she didn't quilt. She was just more like uh, the kind of projects that she would make are just doing some rags or kitchen rags, kitchen towels, that type of thing. She used to sew clothing like way back when, but since then she has not done, or in recent times she hasn't done anything uh, with her sewing. My grandmother, um, because my grandmother and my grandfather both had a house on the sugar plantation, uh, for those of you that know that type of lifestyle, you pretty much make everything yourself and you don't rely on department stores to be around very often. So uh, my grandmother, I know she did have an old treadle machine and I used to despise that machine because that was my form of punishment. <laughs> when she wanted to discipline me, she would make me operate the, the little pedal, and she would always tell me, go pedal faster. So that was my punishment. <laughs> wow. wow. So wonder you didn't turn you into disliking sewing altogether. <laughs> yeah. And I do know that one of my aunts on my father's side of the family, she does sew. Um I don't think she does quilts, but she does make dresses for special occasions. Uh, for her, for my cousin, when she got married, who is her daughter, she made all the bridesmaids' dresses, which were, although they were simple, they were 
quite elegant. That's, that's interesting. Okay. Mona's going to go take a nap. See you later, Mona. Eric, did you see all the fabrics Katie brought home with her, right? I have not yet. <laughs> Robin says, Katie, there is a video by Karen Brown from Just Get It Done Quilts where she is different. She is, she was in different quilting shops that were Dutch. Oh, so she was in the Netherlands. Yep. Hi, Candice. Uh, nope, she said Denmark. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, there's she must have knew where to find them at, um, Robin. Denise says, the saying is whatever the market will bear. If we stop spending, maybe prices will come down. Dr. Kathy Smith says, I was lucky as a Commonwealth country. We could get fabric from the UK pretty easily. It wasn't cheap, though. Candace says, very true, Denise. Sylvia says, any Hawaiian quilts, um, Eric? I have not made a Hawaiian quilt. Um, although I do like applique, I don't like the hand sewing, <laughs> which is why I haven't made one of those. Um, I guess in traditional times, Hawaiian quilt, you really couldn't technically call it a Hawaiian quilt unless it was hand stitched, which is why I avoided that. Although that kind of, that rule is kind of changing over time, but traditionally the Hawaiian quilt would have been hand sewn together, even hand appliqued, hand quilted, just hand stitched all around. So there was no machine still stitching with it. There's still some argument among traditional Hawaiian quilters about machine machine stitching it. Mm -hmm. I may do one in the future. Just right now, I'm trying to wrap my head around doing it by machine rather than by hand. So Hawaii, Hawaii has a style of quilts that they make. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's, um, it's basically an applique pattern that it's sort of like, if you ever made like a paper snowflake, you fold it into a triangle and you mm -hmm. cut out a certain pattern. Um, yeah. Hawaiian quilts use that same technique and what they have uh, what you do is you fold a piece of paper and you cut out like a certain pattern on it. Then you unfold it just exactly like a paper snowflake. You use that piece of paper to trace your applique piece. And from that, you will, you are doing basically needle turn applique onto a bigger piece of fabric. And some of those applique pieces, I mean, you can make them as big or as small as you want. I've seen some real Hawaiian quilts that were hand stitched, hand quilted, and they're queen size bed quilts, but it's got this humongous applique piece that is like 57 by 70, um, just wow. hand stitched right on there. How cool. And then I've seen the smaller projects where people just do like a small pattern on a pillow, um, or like a 12 inch or 16 inch pillow. So it's a, it's a whole art form in and of itself. Uh, Candace is, wait. Robin says, Katie in her video is the name to the shops. Okay, I'll look into that. By the way, speaking of Karen Brown, I don't know if y'all caught, those of you that were here when I made my announcements, I should repeat the announcements just because now we have more people watching. Um, so I called it housekeeping is what I called it. Um, so I gave y'all some dates of what's coming up. So let me repeat the date so you'll know especially since Karen Brown's name was brought up. So on April 23rd, I will be sewing with Luane and chatting. April 24th, I will do a sew and chat with Karen of Just Get It Done. 
or however, however her channels word it. Then April 25th, I'll do a so chat with Liana from Pastry Queen. May the 4th is a so and chat with Cerise. She is one of another designer of the Stronger Together uh, quilt along that was uh, sponsored by Fat Quarter Shop. And I'm really excited about meeting her because uh, she has participated in designing more than one um, Stronger Together quilt. Uh, on the 11th, I have Becca coming for a sew and chat. On May the 16th, I also have a sew and chat with Russ of Quilt Meets World. So that's the schedule as far as guests in the channel so far. At the end of the month, I will be making a pre-recorded, two pre-recorded videos. One of them is going to be what I've accomplished for the month of April. And the other one will be what I've accomplished or finished in the first quarter of 2024, which means that's January, February, March, and April. Um, I will not have as many projects done because I went on my trip, but I still think that I've done pretty good considering that I'm way behind right now. <laughs> Just saying. So y'all have to look forward to this Karen Brown video along with LeWayne and everybody else. So stay tuned. Just make sure you have my your notifications turned on so that when I start, I've already posted the um, channel links, you know, on my channel of all the upcoming ones. But um, you could always go there to each one of the videos and click the notification bell and it will notify you a few hours before the live goes live. Eric, how many lives do you do a, a week? uh just one for the now occasionally i will do maybe a weekend live but that's kind of more of an impromptu thing um usually i'm on tuesday nights starting at 7 30 p.m here pacific time and i usually just go i try to keep it to an hour because i know that a lot of people for a lot of people it is late and so uh just being respectful of everybody's time um Try to keep it to an hour. Sometimes I do go over, depending on the project that I'm doing and how much fun I'm having sewing that night. <laughs> yes, they're going to be live, Nancy. Um, Katie, you have a busy schedule. Yeah, for this coming week, yes, I do. But... You know, you have to adapt to what other people can do with you. And if that's the, you know, and I have waited months. <laughs> Eric will verify this. You know, I've waited several months to get uh, other creators on my um, books. And, and I'm a very patient person, so I don't mind waiting as long as they don't back out on me at the last minute. <laughs> or what I had to do, contact him. See, he would have been live two weeks ago, but I didn't have a voice i woke up and there was no voice all you could hear was squeaking so i had to let him know you know hey we need to move this because i don't have a voice which sucks when that happens um let me see here candace wait lewayne um are you talking about what's behind me right now are you talking about that Ah, that, yes, that is the continuum that Tiffany, Becca, and um, Tiffany, Becca, and Ian are doing. And I've got two rows done. I don't know if you can see it that good or not. But there it is. Two rows. So it looks like a black background, but it's actually a navy blue background. And all of its boutiques. If you haven't figured it out yet, I have a love for boutiques. <laughs> so do I. I just don't use it very often. Oh, I am so in love with it, Eric. You have it's crazy. <laughs> I like it better than I do. 
uh, you know, regular stuff. I just, um, I don't know, boutiques are, not all boutiques, but a lot, of, like the boutiques I like to work with, they're very vibrant. And mm -hmm. I just, I'm in love with the color. That's why that mandala has 30 colors in it behind me that I crocheted. Because that's wow. how much I love messing with color. It's a lot of fun. when, as, You know, somebody asked me how I, um, did I write down what color I was going to use each row that on the mandala? I didn't. I just went with how I felt that day. And I went through my stash and I just picked one. You know, I might, and sometimes I would audition more than one, you know, when I was showing how it, you know, I would look at how it would look next to the row that's already been done. But for the most part, I just, I don't think I hit a place where I couldn't figure out what color I wanted to use. Okay. Joy T is asking about the sewing room. The sewing room hole is now closed. However, they still have to come in and tape it and prime it and paint it. So that part's not been done yet. We been, we don't even know when that's going to happen because according to what they told Nikolai, they told him that they are they have a shortage of painters, so they really don't have a set time of when they're going to come and do that. So I am trying my best to be patient. You know, I've been waiting a long time for them to come over here and deal with this. And, you know, I just, I'm not very happy about it. Put it that way. <laughs> the wolves have gone through a construction project. I know the feeling. Yep. I have to deal with that every day at work. <laughs> you work for a construction company? No, we have a lot of real estate projects in which we purchase properties or release properties, but we have to like re renovate it, remodel it, make it up to our standards. So there's a lot of construction companies that we do deal with. Um, and they always say the same thing. Oh, we get it done in a, in a week. Six months later, you're still complaining about them. Yeah, I just, I just, I, I, and I've said this to even Nikolai. I'm like, how do they expect to make a living if they don't come and follow through on, you know, they, they, they had from October until now. So it's been November, December, January, February, March, April. It's been six months and my room is not fixed. Yeah. And I am losing patience a little bit because I'm tired of being cramped up in this small space I'm in. And it is small. I'm not used to it being this little bit of space, you know? Mm -hmm. well, I don't mind small sewing spaces. I mean, I never had you a big one. You don't get claustrophobic though. because of how tall you are? No. <laughs> I kind of got used to it. When I met Ian and Sean, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> they were so tall. And I felt so short. Because <laughs> I'm not a short woman in the bigger scheme of things. I'm five foot six. But when someone's six two, six three, you look like they're short. And I've never been married to a tall man. Both men in my life that I was you know, my first husband and now Nikolai, they've always been the same height I've been. Yeah, I guess because I always put everything up higher it, on camera, people forget how tall I am. And so when they meet me out in person, they always do the, wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I did with Ian and Sean. I'm like, wow, you guys are really tall. But I've noticed over the last 12 years that um, the Greenlander kids who, who I saw when they were very young, you know, when I first moved here, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you really can't tell if they're going to be tall or short because most Greenlanders are average height or, or shorter. And these youngsters, as soon as they hit their teenage years, they're 
a lot of them are starting to be a lot taller. The the Greenland, the Inuit body, I guess, is evolving over time, which is interesting. Or at least I think it's interesting. Must be a change in diet. That's what I'd say. Well, you have the technology, you know, has changed. True. As far true. as how, how you can hunt and fish. So, um, I mean, some stuff is still done the old way, but um, I think just that plus uh, food is more abundant, even though there is times when it's not as abundant because uh, a crew or a container ship can't get into the harbor right. because there's ice all over the place, like what we've been having since the end of February. You know, so sometimes it detours a uh, container ship from making it into port and delivering groceries from, you know, other countries. But most Greenlanders um, supplement their food table by hunting and fishing. And the ones who can't, who don't own a boat or are not physically able to get out and do it, uh, a lot of the hunters and fishermen well, if they if they caught a little more than they intended on, they'll take it up to the fresh meat market, fish market is what it's called actually, and they will sell it to those people who can't go out and do it themselves. And if if a whale is um dispatched, I think that's the newest name for hunting and killing animals, um. It just, all you got to do is have one person say, hey, there's a whale down at the fish market. The whole town will come. Wow. And within, <laughs> usually by that afternoon or the next day, that fresh meat is totally gone. They don't waste any part of a whale. Look, you guys, I don't know how many Eric's got done so far, but here's my first one. Pretty. <laughs> <laughs> And then, um, of course, we have, um, my husband works for a, a company called Royal Greenland, and they have big, huge um, factory shrimp trawlers. How many in that fleet for the shrimp? Isn't it like six? Yeah. They have about six factory shrimp trawlers. And then how many of those that, how many other ones are the fishing boats, fishing ships? Probably. Oh, they me. have two. They just... Uh, when did, um, what's the name of that one called? The, the newest one? Um, uh, Abadoc, right? Yeah. The newest one. Oh, no, that's, uh, it's a uh, do relic. There's one after the Abadoc? No, no, they've been like the Dalnock and uh, they're mo modernizing a couple of all the ships now. No, but I'm talking about the newest one to the fleet, uh, which is a new one. It's made from scratch. The uh, Dalnock. Oh, that was the oldest, new, newest one that, that they make. Now they're re replicating it to other. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's been the first new one in years. Yeah. So they just, how long is that one? Nearly 83 meters. So it's 83 meters long by. I think it's 18. 18 meters wide. And it has. A thousand tons of. It can hold over a thousand tons of fish or shrimps. Shrimp. Yeah. Wow. And it has four gears, right? Yeah. And it has four gears on it. What I mean by gears is nets that wow. are how many meters long usually? Probably a little, little bit shorter than a gamelix, but around probably around 120 meters long. Yeah, so about 120 meters long. So that's that's an enormous ship. And uh the one Nikolai works on. The Agamalek, that one is 75 meters, 75 meters long. long by 16? <clears throat> uh, 14 something. 14 I mean. something wide, yeah. Um, and it can, how many sailors can live on board? Uh, we can have uh, 32 crew members on board, but we usually are 24, 25. Oh, I didn't know you could go that high up on them. Nope. We can. Wow. That is so cool, right? 
Okay. It's an old ship now, though. Yeah, it needs to be put to, it needs to be put to something. She's a 23-year-old lady now. Yeah. Wow. She's been working a long time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been working for the company for nearly 30 years now. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> this this uh, July month, there will be 30 years since I started it. You know, these days, that's, also, that's almost unheard of. Yeah, uh, I think it surprises a lot of people from the U.S. because they're like, he's made a living of it. A lot of people make a living at it here. It's one of the um, probably fewer jobs that you can stay as long as you want if you're willing to work hard. And it's not an easy job because you're out in Arctic conditions year round. You never, you know, there's no stop fishing. So here's my first crunk, crunk quote, you guys, or block. All trimmed up. Pretty. Okay. Let me backstroke here. Did I just say backstroke? <laughs> oh, back scroll you guys sorry all right let me see eric how long did it take you to get used to your rotary cutter you must uh, be using not, not very long actually um because my hands are really big i did find that this style of rotary cutter uh it relaxed my wrist a lot and because you're using the palm of your hand to actually power the rotary cutter and uh, kind of slice through the fabric, to me, this was a lot more comfortable. I know a lot of people who use these, um, these rotary cutters like this, it does take them a while to get used to it because sometimes they hold it like this or they hold it like that. And for me, that causes problems on my wrist which is primarily why I've switched over to this um, Martelli cutter so I know for a lot of people it does get used uh, it does take a while to get a little bit used to and primarily my concern was back here because when you expose the blade it sort of seems like your finger is going to get sliced off right back there but in reality when you hold it correctly there, your middle finger is not even close to the blade, but I know a lot of people, when they watch it for the first time, there's always that concern that you're gonna cut your finger on there. And it's actually very, very safe, much safer than your regular average normal cutter. So which is, um, yeah, it didn't take long for me to get used to it, but I know for a fact, a lot of people, it took some time, but they, they love it now. Dr. Kathy, are you talking about the uh, um, continuum for Friday? It started yesterday. Um, and then they're going to be live Sunday also. Uh, I, I think Ian's live, actually. But they're doing a Zoom today as well. It just, it's, in, it's in the same time as my live, and I didn't realize that. Okay. Joy, why do you say poor whale? Um. The hunters who hunt whales here do not use what you would envision you see other nations use. They don't have this big, huge fishing vessel with one of those harpoons that causes a whale to suffer. Hunters use regular small boats, and they use a gun. There is nothing inhumane about what they do, and they do not take more from nature than what they need. So... There is no overfishing of whale or anything else here. It's just not done because um, it's drilled into their DNA that you don't mistreat nature. So they teach this from generation to generation. You never take more than you need. You leave nature how you found it. And you use as many parts of what you kill in your everyday life. So there's nothing bad about hunting a whale, especially because we cannot depend on this country will survive way longer than most countries because they don't we don't necessarily have to get food from other countries because most everybody's still doing what they've been doing for thousands of years. They just have modern technology that makes it a lot easier. 
And you, you can't fault us for eating whale meat because this is how they survived Arctic conditions. The seal and whale are high in certain types of nutrients that help the body manage body heat to keep you from losing body heat. So this all has a purpose. Kat, Kathy says she didn't sign up for it. I have too many projects going on right now. Joyce, so do all animals, but they're part of the food chain, just like everything else is. They're just not over, they're not being hunted to extinction here, put it that way. And, you know, during the summer, we get mink whale, minky whales, humpback whales, narwhals, but not down here where I'm at. Sometimes we see an occasional humpback, but mostly they catch um, minkies and um, a couple of types of porpoise nikolai somebody had a question maybe you can answer yeah someone asked uh where did it go are there bounties on whales ramming boats it's where the have done that i just can say that doesn't even happen here but I've never heard of that. I've been doing that. That's orcas doing that. Yeah. Not a regular whale. Orcas are not whales. Let me. Somebody asked about whale meat. Oh yeah. Yeah, you can answer that, honey. No, not this one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Someone asked how they know that the whale meat is safe to eat. Do they test whales periodically for I things? Think, yeah, I think so. I think they, they have scientists that test for that? Yeah, I think they give it to give it to the someone to test it for some purity. I think it's, it, there are some certain whales that we are uh, can't eat. Joy wants to know if you can eat orcas. Yeah, I think I think well because we, they're in the porpoise family, right? Yeah, we we eat God, we eat them all. Have you? Has anyone ever eaten much? Not that I remember, though. But um, I think there has been some. Sean, um, orcas is a new thing in the Greenland waters right now. So here's what's happening because of global warming. Um, on the west coast. Fishermen have been have started seeing schools of mackerels. They're migrating north is what's happening. And yellowfin tuna are following the mackerel. And orcas are following the yellowfin tuna. So they've started seeing some orcas off the Greenland west coast. No, east coast, sorry. I get those backwards all the time. It's there, Sean. Okay. Okay, I just looked at looked. It's the killer whale orcas. Yeah. Yeah, orcas. Greenland hasn't experienced that problem that Spain is is experiencing. And I'm pretty sure that the reason they're ramming those boats is because something must have happened to some some of their pot or something. You know, we have to respect the water just like we have to respect what's on land. And if you have no respect for nature, then you know nature fights back. Bite you in the butt. Because of the warming, the warming that's going on, and we got our sea ice in the third week of February, which is still here. There's been a lot of um, polar bears being stuck on the ice that's ending up down here, and a lot more than usual, actually. Someone took a picture yesterday of a polar bear just outside her house here in this town. Wow. So I don't know. Yeah, so it's about to be a problem, I think, because the, the bears are hungry. <laughs> well, if it hasn't been a problem for the past number of years <laughs> no it hadn't this is something new wow you usually don't you might see one polar bear every i don't know two or three years that gets stuck and gets caught on an iceberg 
But the last three years, we've been seeing a lot of them. I wish I could see them because every time one come, one came through our town, he must have came through the mountains on the other end of the lake. He came through that little V. He walked all the way across the lake. And he left a trail, not his paw prints, but where he was trying to break through the ice. So apparently he could smell fish. And um, he was leaving a trail. And then at some point he got off the lake and he walked down the road all the way to the harbor and got back in the water because <laughs> there's cameras throughout town, throughout the town. So there was actual video of him walking through town and he never bothered anything, but he went straight to the harbor and they tried to run him away, but he wouldn't leave and they ended up having to shoot him. Oh, that's sad. But the bear didn't go to waste. He ended up getting, uh-oh. Denise, I missed what you said. Oh, I missed what she said. Darn it. Uh, Luane says, I saw Orca the Killer Whale movie way back in 1977, and it made me scared of whales. <laughs> whales are not bad. Okay. I'm more scared of sharks than I am of whales. Oh, I'm with you there. That's why I don't get more than knee deep in the water at the beach. I just, you know, if I can't see them swimming up to me, then that's, you know, creeps me out. Of course, I have a diver friend in Hawaii who says, sharks are more scared of you than you are of them. I'm like, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't think so. It, I'm sure it gets quite confusing for a whale, uh, not whale, uh, a shark hunting and think that that's prey up on top of the water when it's human beings yeah. that are in their fishing, you know, in their hunting zones, you know, I'm sure that it's very confusing for them. Well, well it's some of my experience with eating whale meat. To those that don't know it, know it. most of them's heard that. I don't know, but. Did did Eric know about it? Did you? No. I don't know if he's. Was that a no or yes? Nope. No. Is it no? Oh well. Um, the best way for me to describe what whale tastes like. You know how when you've been away from the coast and as you get closer to the coast again, you know how your nose picks up that scent of sea air. Yeah. But the, the smell is not exactly the air. It's what's coming off the water, I think. And your brain doesn't know. Um, here's how I can describe it. Because I've had whale steaks. It's tender like beef tenderloin. It's red like beef. It doesn't taste like beef, though. But. When you first get that first scent of sea air, to me, it tastes like that smell. Mm, okay. It's it's um, tender and fresh and clean. I think is what I'm trying to say. So mm -hmm. it it doesn't it's it doesn't have it's not it doesn't have a gamey taste or nothing like that. It's just it reminds me of the ocean the minute I take a bite of it. But it has its advantages because when you eat whale meat, it keeps you warm. <laughs> when my husband eats whale soup, yeah, he's like a heater in the bed. I'm like, oh, my gosh, he's so hot. <laughs> it's like all this heat coming off his body, you know. <laughs> so Denise said, I removed the comment about eating whale meat. I thought you were talking about a beach whale, not one that is hunted. I wasn't paying attention. Uh, Kathy says, my crazy daughter still wants to go to Barrow, Alaska and see the polar bears. I think she's crazy. I want to see a polar bear, but not up close. But close enough, I can take a picture of it. <laughs> Tessa says, your strip blocks remind me of my friend. She made several and created yardage to make a coat. 
It was really nice. Oh, that's cool. Uh, Robin says she loves your block, Eric. Well, thank you. I've seen polar bears up close enough, so I know how it looks like. That's because you're lucky enough to see them. Uh-huh. Not everybody's as lucky as you are. I haven't seen one up close. I've been trying to contact you while while you were out. I mean, while you were asleep on, on Messenger. I did get the footage out of it, though. Send it to you later. Yeah, but it's still not the same thing as being on a boat, seeing it in person. Uh huh. It's the same concept of not getting to see a whale, a humpback whale up close and personal. <laughs> like the one you took a picture of? Yeah, that all I could see was the blow, it blowing air out its uh, blowhole. Truth be told, I'd probably freak out if I see anything out in the ocean and I'm swimming out there. There's not too much swimming going on in the fjords here. It's too cold. But the kids swim in the lake when it's thawed out. Within days of it being thawed out, you'll see little kids down at the more shallower end of the lake. And I'm like, really? They're not cold? Well, apparently they're not. No ice bathing. <laughs> now there's tourists that come here and do that. What's it called? The Arctic challenge. And they jump in the water, you know, the fjord water or, or off the coast, they'll do it. But outside of that, not usually. I'm sure all the kids at some point have, have you, you know, have you jumped into the Atlantic, babe? Uh, the Danish coast. Well, that's not the Atlantic running all along that coast. That's not, not the Atlantic. Talking about the Atlantic. Because that's different. Okay, let's see what else is being said. <laughs> Eric, did you follow Becca? I do. Uh, there's a uh, there was a, I think it was last year that we were just having this uh, holiday party. There's a there's a picture that we have given her as a surprise. It was it was, it was my picture. Oh, of a polar bear. We we gave it to her as a as a canvas wrapped uh, picture. Uh huh. No, I don't think I've seen that video. You can always show them the picture if you want. Yeah. Okay, this is a little thick, so I'm going to trim this down. But first, I'm going to cut it to size here. So how long has it been since you moved from the States? When August the 18th rolls around this year, I'll be hit my 13th year of living here. Wow. Yeah. And we've been married 13 years. So in January, we hit our 14th wedding anniversary. This is the picture that uh, I we sent it to Pega. Oh, that's beautiful. I've taken the picture myself. Wow. <clears throat> that is beautiful. He's lucky. He gets to see all kinds of things when he's at sea. <laughs>
like icebergs. Yeah, the big ones. The skyscraper size ones. This country is really beautiful. Anyone who can, you know, has a bucket list should put it on here and try to see it within the next few years because one day the ice cap's going to be gone. Oh. Because it's melting fast. Mm -hmm. Especially down here. People, I'm sorry. I hear a lot of people going to Iceland. Not a lot of people, or I guess a lot of people overlook Greenland, though. Yep, but um, I think that will change once uh, they're finished with all the runways and stuff that they're working on right now to make it easier for tourists to get into the country easier because mostly you see them coming in on cruise ships. But ah. um, come November, they will be intercontinental flights starting because Nuke becomes an international airport that can land wide-body passenger jets. Mm -hmm. And I am looking forward to that. Because that means they get secure flights by flying out of new to the U.S. instead of having to go through Denmark. Because it adds it adds to more travel hours because we have to go through Denmark. Which sometimes can be downright annoying. Tyler, um... It wears you out. Oh, tell me about it. On certain airlines from Los Angeles, I either have to fly from Los Angeles to Dallas or Los Angeles to Chicago, and then I can go back home to Hawaii. <laughs> I want to go to Hawaii. I just don't know what part of Hawaii I want to see. No, I'll just go and see any part. They're all it's all beautiful. <laughs> yep, it's on my bucket list. So I hope to do that in the future, too. I think we're going to have to just pl plan a vacation where we just go straight there and don't go anywhere else, you know? Oh, this can be cut right here. Okay. Oh, uh, hang on. I'm going to look at the screen in just a minute, you guys. Just getting me some more strings to sew with. <gasps> Eric, aren't you going to um, Arizona soon to sew with Tiffany? Uh, no plans to. And I know, well, on a um, Tiffany is trying to sort of politely encourage me to move to Lake Havasu since she knows I'm looking for a different spot to move to. <laughs> so she's been texting me and sending me all these apartments I should look at, job opportunities. Um, I wouldn't mind actually moving out to her, her part of the city because it is very, it's, how do, how do I describe it? It's like small town living, but not so rural. You do still have some modern uh, conveniences with it. And I, I actually kind of like it out there. I mean, Nice people, nice, nice place to live. Uh, you do have um, um, your occasional tourists that come in during the spring and summer and, or during the winter, I should say. But you know, it's kind of every time I go there, I feel, feel so much more relaxed because it's a little bit of a slower pace of life. Um, unlike here in Los Angeles, where everything is rushed, rushed, rushed and sit in traffic. So. Yeah, I understand that. That's something that when I first moved here, um, I, you know, when you when you when you come from a fast paced country where 
everybody's always in a hurry. And it's, you don't realize uh, how much that affects your life, not to mention, um, the other thing is, is about how noisy it is. And then you come over here where it's quiet. I mean, we have noise here, don't get me wrong, but not compared to over there. Mm -hmm. And, um, but also you have to learn patience. I'm not kidding you. You've got to learn patience because nothing gets done fast here. Not anything. <laughs> I guess we're the exception because we're quilters and nothing gets done fast in the quilting world either. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> and I don't know I didn't realize how much how how noisy our country was until after you know I went through a period where I didn't go home for let's see I moved here in 2011 I went to the United States in 2012 but then I didn't come back again until 2017 I think it was and that's when I noticed wow the cities are noisy uh, the airports are noisy I mean mm -hmm. it's just you don't notice it because, you know, you get desensitized to that. And then when you're uh, gone for a little while, then you really do notice it. So I can, I can imagine how Greenlanders felt um, when the United States um, had Greenland in its protection during World War II, and they they came to this town to put a big old radio station on top of a mountain and they started doing construction and everything else and their quiet little town turned into a noisy town with big trucks and you know all kinds of things and one of the one of the locals who happens to be a famous artist talks a lot about what it was like growing up during World War II in a town that was peaceful and then turned to noise uh, so when you go down to the harbor, it's noisy down there. But we live on the lake, so we don't hear as much of the noise. That's one of the things that, um, like, I like to watch local news from Hawaii. And that's one of the debates that they're having is because there's, because Hawaii has become this very popular tourist destination they're getting so overly populated that it's the question of how do you balance that type of tourism economy with just making sure that locals don't get inconvenienced and it's a it's a big problem actually with a lot of the yep. noise a lot of the traffic um but mostly what a lot of people are concerned about is just the pollution there's trash on the streets now that nobody or people are just kind of tossing out of their cars. Um, and it's a, to the native Hawaiians, it's really a sign of disrespect because you don't go to someone else's home and just leave trash lying around someplace. You kind of make sure you clean up after yourself, or at least that's what the local custom is. And, you know, people who grew up there, they're now getting very vocal about it where they're saying they do not want to have their town turned into a tourist town. And now, you know, they're taking it to the polls. They're voting for people who are not in favor of tourism. Um, yeah, it's becoming a huge debate back home. And I've been kind of watching it a little bit because I've noticed even when I went back to my hometown, although it looks the same, it doesn't have the same feeling because there's just new businesses, new people in town. And although I can understand that you gotta make progress and you gotta move along with the times, but it's just sad to see your favorite spots kind of get out, um, get pushed out for some other political agenda or some other agenda, I should say. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's something that this country is going to have to, um, you know, there is some discussion already about um, 
whether tourism is going to affect uh, or how it's going to affect life in Greenland and also how it's going to either, uh, you know, either pull nature down due to pollution or whatever, or what you were talking about, how people treat nature when they're visiting it. Mm -hmm. So there has been some discussion about that too recently. And the other discussion that's still been a hot topic and so far the vo voters' voice has been heard is um, two hours from our where we live at. There's a little town called Narsok. And I think 2,000 people, between 1,000 to 2,000 people live in that small town. And, um, but there's this big, when you first come into the fjord to Narsok, picture this you have this enormous beautiful mountain in the backdrop fjords uh, are on three sides of this town mm -hmm. there's icebergs dotting all of the fjord then on the left side of this mountain you see this valley there's this valley going down and all of this is all green and pristine and there's a big waterfall that goes down the side of that mountain on the front side of the mountain is where all of the houses are and apartments that are built there. And then on this side, it's kind of like an industrial an, an industrial area. And when you're coming into Narsak, you really don't pay much attention to what you see because it's kept it's the way it's kept, it's not visible until you really happen to be looking. That mountain has been a contentious discussion because some people want to crack it open. Oh no! Because it's no, full no. of it's full of uranium. Ah, oh, okay. But most Greenlanders are like, no. Because you know, I live two hours away, and they crack that mountain up, and we might as well move. Because it's going to destroy nature down here. Yeah. It can get into our drinking water because you know a lot happens when you're mining uranium. Mm -hmm. And that's something I think the Greenlandic people have got to, especially the younger generations, they really need to be paying attention to what's going on so that they can keep other countries from uh, coming in and take all their resources and Greenland gets nothing back. Yeah. We see it in Africa. You know, the, and that's why I think a lot of Greenlanders are like, no, we're not doing this. No, let's not. Okay, let me read what's going on in the channel. Hi, Christine. Welcome, welcome. Good to see you. Keep being declined. What, Nikki, what are you being declined on? All right, let me go backwards. Honey, someone asked, how far from the bear were you when you took that picture? Probably, probably around 20, 30 meters away. So that's what? Meter. Like uh, between 100 feet, I think. Close to around 100 feet. Yeah. Three meters is, uh, let me see. Nikki, what are you talking about? Please explain about you. You answered. Oh, for the. Are you talking about for the Facebook group? Can you have a look at the Facebook group and see if she got rejected, babe? Her name is Nikki. Nicola Johnson? Probably. Did she get. If you go into. If you click on it, does it show she's still not being let in? No, nope, she's apparently not. She messaged, she tried to message me telling her she's not a bot. Hold on a minute, you guys. I got to see what's going on. Can you bring up the channel? I mean, the group, and let me have a look. And while you're doing that, I did see a question from Denise Spigner. She says, Eric, can you go whale watching in Southern California? Uh, yes, you can. There's actually a national park. Um, is it the Santa Monica Recreational Area? 
You can give me my phone. There is a national park where you can actually take a boat ride to go whale watching, dolphin watching, and whatever else you can find out and see. Um, I've never been personally. I've only done whale watching tours in Hawaii. And so uh, we usually uh, try to encounter the humpback whales. But when you do see the whale come up for air, even if it's not breaching or jumping out but, um, from the water, it's like you're a little kid. You're all excited because the whale came up and you run around the boat <laughs> just to follow the whale. And you feel silly, but it's really exciting to actually watch that in real life rather than just watching it on like the National Geographic channel. <laughs> Nikki, let me look into what's going on, okay? Don't don't try to go back in until I can figure out what's going on. That's going to take me a hot minute to figure out. In the meantime, let me finish reading the rest of this. Uh... Sylvia said there was orcas in her bay yesterday. The Wayne says we have polar bears at the zoo here and they are goofballs always playing with balls i feel sorry for those polar bears being in the zoo that's not what they were meant to be doing uh eric you can go well what oh that was answered but which was it structure She's trying to get into the Queen Greenland Lake, group, I think. Greenland culture. Yeah. Do orchids, yeah, orchids, orcas are being seen off the West Coast, not West Coast, sorry, East Coast. Um, I guess it's not too cold because they're coming up there. Uh, I thought orcas like colder waters. <laughs> the Northern Atlantic goes all the way around both sides of Greenland, just about. Yeah. Wayne says, aren't you all worried about tourists renting nature beautiful, the nature beautiful of the area? We're all worried about that, of course. And um, he, uh, people here will be looking out for that. Um, the reason there's been a big discussion recently about tourism is because last summer, one of the cruise ships went into one of the fjords where they shouldn't have been, and they uh, ran aground. And they sat there for a week while while they found someone that could pull a big ship out of there. And when you saw the overhead, somebody used a um, drone. When you saw it from overhead, you could see what had happened. They had gotten too close to one side of the fjord where the water was draining from the ice cap. And it was sending sediments with it while it was uh, draining. And so there was this big mud hole just outside of where it was draining. And the captain, I don't know how he even done it. He got the whole rear end of the ship stuck in the mud hole. <laughs> and you could literally see how the ship was sitting. That the whole prop and everything was down in the mud. When I lived in San Diego and L.A., I saw lots of gray whales, blues, makos. Last time I was in Catalina, someone told me they spotted a hammerhead. That doesn't surprise me. Everything's yeah. migrating because of how the water is warming up in areas that they don't normally congregate in. In fact, uh, they spotted a gray whale that was extinct off the east coast of the United uh, Canada and the United States. Mm -hmm. they thought it was this extinct one showed and, up there and they yeah. it came from because the ice had broken up on the stick where normally the ice stays is melted so that whale found its way over to the east coast of North America yep I heard about that yep that's pretty cool that's a big whale So one of the things I like to do after after I trim my block, usually when I trim the block, I'll make it line up to whatever foundation size that I cut. And one of the things I like to do is on 
well, the excess that I cut off, if it's big enough, like this black piece here, um, I will rip it off and drill these pieces into another bin where I can just sew crumbs together. That's another thing that I do like to do from time to time is just take little pieces like this, sew them together, and then make some crumb blocks out of it. Yep, that's what I'm going to save those small, those bigger pieces that I cut off when I trim the block. I'm going to save them for that. Use that color. Use this color. And in fact, I actually have a container, oh, not this container, but um, here it Kathy is. Kathy says she saw that. That was very interesting. N equals nerd here. <laughs> <laughs> so I do have a stack of these blocks here. These are all crumb blocks that I've sewn over the years, and I just accumulate them, saving them for some project in which I'm not sure what exactly I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something with them. So these are just random scrap, little small scrap pieces that I just kind of sew together and then squared it up into a four and a half inch square. And I don't know, one of these days I'll have to think of a project that I can do with it. I don't think that this is going to be big enough. Oh, I need a wider piece. Another project for a rainy day. I love how you can take fabric and uh, leftover pieces and turn it into something else with, instead of throwing it away. Mm -hmm. And the price, well, these days with the prices of fabric, you kind of have to get creative about using all of it. Yeah. <clears throat> I agree with you on that one. He says, I, I totally get that the being fed up with the disrespectful tourists, but it must be a delicate dance since tourism is Hawaii's major industry. It is. Yeah, it's going it to be is. the same thing here in Greenland because that's going to be a big industry before it's over with. So I bet from your perspective, you feel that way too. <clears throat> it is. Oh. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't know what is wrong with my voice today now. <laughs> But, um, you know, I think people in Hawaii generally can accept that tourism or they can accept tourists coming into their state or into their space. It's just the disrespect that they show towards the land and the disrespect that they show towards the people there. That understanding that they are guests, not, um, not landlords or not the owners of the place. But it is a delicate dance between commerce and just a fight against commerce and, how do I say it, nature, as well as just general living. Because on one hand, without the tourists coming in, a lot of people will just not have any jobs. And yep. we saw that happening when the pandemic shut everybody down. But on the other hand, it's it's how much of how much tolerance do people have in terms of having the extra crowd, the extra um, traffic, the extra hassles or overpopulation or overpopulation on certain things. I think for me, though, what really kind of bugs me is the certain areas or the certain spots that used to be just you would only find locals there. Those are now being exposed and overtaken by a lot of tourists who want to um, experience the same thing, which I don't mind that. But when you got 
one to 200 of them coming to a spot that maybe can only hold 20. That's where I think a lot of the locals are getting really, that's part of the reason why a lot of locals are just getting frustrated with it. Does, does your locals have the same problem our locals have? They don't understand why tourists walk in the middle of the road instead of being courteous and walking on the outside edges of the road. Have you seen yeah. that? Yeah. Because that's the biggest complaint here. I don't understand. In America, we do not walk in the middle of the road. Why do they walk in the middle of the road over here? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's. I guess there's a lot of things that people will do on vacation when they're not at home. <laughs> I guess because I don't understand it. When I when I'm doing um when I'm guiding a group, I always make sure that they're never in the middle of the road because life has to go on with everybody here that lives here. You know, they all have jobs and school and everything else, and you know they can't stop doing what they're doing just because you know tourists are here to visit. Yep. And I think it's kind of, I, I wish the cruise ships would talk to their guests about, you know, when you go to a town, don't walk in the middle of the road, walk on the outside of the road, like most normal people do, you know, but that's not discussed. Hello, Janice. Thank you, Christine. Guess who did the braiding? <laughs> <laughs> You're not late, Christine. I know I'm late, but what are you working on, Katie and Eric? We are working on string quilt blocks. Just using our scraps. So here's mine, and Eric, show her what you've got so far. So far, I only have one done. He's got two. No, you've got three. Wow, you're really fast. Four. Three, <laughs> four of them. Wow. Well, these are only six and a half, so you can sew them pretty quickly together. But then you've also been paying attention to the chat, whereas I have not been. Yeah, I'm trying to keep up with chat at the same time. I'm trying to learn how to sew and multitask at the same time. And let me tell you what, I don't think it's all that easy. No, it's not. Because <laughs> I don't, I seem to get less sewing done. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? And more yakking done. You try and do a live thinking that you're going to get most more sewing done because you spend time sewing on the live. But in reality, you're looking at so many other different things that you actually do less sewing and more talking. <laughs> yes, that's pretty much it. I love it when I have someone, you know, sewing with me or or like when Nikolai sometimes he'll get on the live and build Legos and he helps with the chat a little bit. And that helps me tremendously because. That means I, I might can get a little bit of sewing done, you know? Yeah. Because I don't want I don't want people to go away dissatisfied. I guess that was one of the biggest surprises when I first started going live is how many things you have to be aware of, not just what you're doing and making sure that the chat or the live is entertaining for people. But all the technical stuff that you got to know, making sure that the Zoom or whatever software you're using is up and running, making sure your microphones are working, making sure your camera's coming through, making sure your internet is up and running well. It's, it's a lot of work. Speaking of microphones, I haven't bought one to use. So do you guys have trouble hearing me? Hang on a minute, babe. I'm cutting some. If that's the issues. Who is that just trying to get in? Nikki? All right, you guys, hang on a minute. I got to go see what's going on on the, ch uh, the group so that Nikki can get into the, all right, Facebook group. Hold on a minute. Hey, so Terry and Robin Marie. Hello. Um, I got a question for everybody out in the chat. What is your favorite go-to 
block when you want to just do some mindless sewing? Are you a string teaser like us, or is there something else that you like to sew? Is saying she didn't answer the questions. Bot must be being weird. Nicola or uh, Nikki, can you see if you got let in now? Please go have a look. Okay. All right. Wait, wait. No. Where'd it go? Okay. Nikki, can you check and see if you can get in now? Because I undid the what it's doing. It might think she's spamming because she requested it more than once. Can that happen, Eric, or do you know? It sometimes can. But usually because you'll you get a notification that it was, uh, or this person may have been blocked for a specific reason. Well, this thing is saying she never answered the questions, but she says she has, so. Strange that it's acting out. Wow, she's tried many times. There's a bunch of these. They, it, the bot might be thinking she's spamming. She might. Or it might be, yeah. I'm trying to undo them because there's a lot of them. This is very strange. So it's Jean Rohrer. Um, I'm sorry if I butchered your name, but she's asking, would you mind doing a demo of removing the paper? So normally I wouldn't, I would actually keep the block with the paper on until I'm actually ready to use it to sew it into a quilt, but I'll just go ahead and do it now. Since I, I usually sew on this machine with a one and a half inch or one and a half inch, one and a half millimeter uh, stitch length. And so it kind of perforates the per paper in the back very uh, a lot so that it's so easy for me to just remove the paper. And again, I usually don't do this until I'm ready to actually sew the block into a quilt or make it into something else, but it's pretty simple to just remove the paper. Um, again, I do recommend using a smaller stitch length something between a two and a one and a half, or some people even go down to a one in uh, one millimeter. But the more, or the smaller the stitch length you make it, the easier it will be to rip the paper. And so whenever I'm ready to use these blocks into an actual quilt, I'm usually sitting in front of the TV, kicking out the paper. So some people, for me, it's just easier to just bend the seam a little bit and that starts the rip, uh, the ripping of the paper and I can easily pull it out from there. I do hear of reports from other quilters saying that when they use paper, um, a lot of times the seams come out. That's usually because of um, poor tension, I guess. 
I've never had that problem, but once in a while I do. But if it does happen, I just will kind of do um, like a quick repair and just stitch over that one area that when with the seam or where the stitch is ripped out. But usually not a big problem. Um, again, a lot of it has to do with the fact that I'm using a smaller stitch length. Now, if you're using a foundation that is fabric based, like a muslin or just some other cotton fabric, you don't have to rip out those stitches. You can just actually leave that piece of fabric in there and sew it into the quilt and nobody will know that it's there. On these string blocks, you, you can turn them different directions too, right, Eric? Like if I wanted, yeah. <clears throat> when I got ready to sew them together, if I wanted to sew them... If I wanted to sew them in a different direction, you could also do that, right? Yep. You can do you can do them together. You can do them all in the same direction. <clears throat> if I can get myself oriented or some something like that. Um, a lot of times I will just turn them into uh, or pair this with like a solid fabric and turn them into half square triangles. And of course. When you do that, it just opens a whole lot of other doors and design options for you. So, and then again, with the quilt behind me, I made a turn dash block out of using strings and pieces of solid fabric. So I'm kind of exploring different options as to what you can do with string blocks like this. Um, not just making string quilts, but what other things can you do with it? And Play around with using a string block and making a traditional quilt block to see how it comes out because you might surprise yourself with it. Yep. I agree with you on that one. You can turn into something really cool the more you mess with it. Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay. Yep. So now I've got two done. Now I need to get some more interfacing. I've had this interfacing for a long time. It came in, I think it came in a um, so sampler box. And I've been sitting on them because I didn't know what to do with them. But now I am making use of it. Oh, uh, what, which brand of interfacing is it? It's the, what did I do with the bag? It came in a bag. Hold on. What did I do with it? I have two of them, so let me go get the other one. Don't know what to do with the plastic bag. Or not. It's a uh, lightweight of. Uh, it's the really lightweight interfacing, and I think it might have been a Lori Holt product. Mm, well, it's from Fat Quarter Shop. Uh, that would make yeah. sense. Yeah. I can't find the bag that I took it out of. I might have already thrown it away for all I know. Hey, Donnell. Hey, Donnell. Hey, Denise. And Michelle the Quilter says, hi, Katie and Eric. Great to see you. Two of my favorites <laughs> love those blocks. Hello, Michelle. I have trouble catching your lives because when I see them, I'm just going to bed by then. <laughs> <laughs> this six hours difference is hard. Oh, gosh. You know, it's interesting, though, because because I'm on really late for a lot of people, um, I might get maybe a few, a handful of people on the actual live, but 
I get hundreds of people watching it after it goes or they're catching the replay. Well, that's good on that part. Yeah. I'm just thankful you keep the replay. Yeah. I know while I was gone to the US, I didn't have much time to watch videos, much less even try. I only went live once while I was gone. Mm -hmm. I just I kept running out of time. <laughs> and I did a whole lot of driving. So by the time you're done driving and doing what you're doing, you're already tired. But it my being gone, I don't know if you've experienced this, but it kind of hurt my viewers watching. Because, you know, they've already seen most everything. And I'm still so new of a channel, I don't have backups made yet, you know, to take care of, you know, lulls of when mm -hmm. I'm gone somewhere or something. Okay. And we use a yellow and a red down the middle. Let's see here. What shall I choose for the middle? Let's go with this very turquoisey color right here for the middle. Kathy says she likes to sew her strings on the batting. Oh, yeah. I've heard people doing that. It's sort of like a modified pull-as-you-go kind of technique. Yep. That would save time, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. Only problem with my machine is it doesn't like sewing through batting. <laughs> I wonder why. It's not really built for sewing through thicker materials because um, when it comes to industrial machines like this one, it's very, very particular, meaning it's only built to do a certain function. It'll do it well, but if you try and take it, so, or if you try and sew something or do something with it that it wasn't built to do, it just uh -huh. doesn't perform as well. And that's one of the downsides of getting a industrial machine like this is that it's built to be sort of like a specialized machine. So it will sew through quilting cotton, but it, once I try and sew through things like batting or even denim, it'll struggle trying to get a good stitch quality. So a lot of times when I'm, if I am doing binding on this particular machine, I have really have to take it slow, um, like doing a stitch every second kind of slow. <laughs> As to the, as opposed to like the 5,000 stitches it'll do on just regular quilting cotton. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, that was one of the biggest misconceptions that I had about industrial machines. That you know, if I get an industrial machine, I can just work on any project, so through anything. And that's actually not true. You know, my mom had this um, Singer sewing machine. It was a metal one. Um, it was probably from the late 60s, maybe. It's when they made things really strong when they built it. Mm -hmm. And she had that sewing machine up all the way up to when she passed away. I don't know what my brother done with it, but I sewed dresses on it and all skirts and shirts and stuff. She also sometimes sewed leather on it and they would let her. She wouldn't have any trouble with it. It was interesting wow. that she could do that. Yeah. Uh, Robin Marie, yes, it is a Juki machine. Yeah, kind of weird that way. Once I found Juki machines, I never tried anything else. I just stuck with them. <laughs> I don't 
don't like how loud the juki is. Or the TL2010 or whatever it's called. That mm. one. Yeah, it's that, it is that was loud. really loud. I told Nikolai if I owned one of them, I'd be wearing earplugs all the time. Because <laughs> I seriously don't want my hearing being ruined by a sewing machine. Well, I think it's it. I don't know. When you see it on video. This machine does tend to be a little bit louder. I think that just might just be the microphones or the technology. But when you sew with it in person, it's not as loud. Or it's actually not really loud at all to me. Which uh, which Juki do you have? I currently have, or the one I'm sewing on right now, is the Juki DDL5550 which is an industrial grade machine, um, kind of an older model, but it's, I mean, like you said, it's one of those models where it was built to last. But it's, it needs to last if you're gonna pay high dollar for it. Right, well, actually this machine is cheaper than most of um, the more modern machines that are out there because I spent less than a thousand dollars on this machine and that included the shipping and the table that it's attached to considering the fact that if you can buy a bernina for what five or six thousand dollars <throat> i was going to buy a bernina and i ended up buying a genomi instead the uh, the lady who was selling the sewing machines, she asked me why I wanted a Bernina. And I said, because everybody was preaching, get a Bernina, get a Bernina as a quilting machine. And so when she showed me this Janome, she said, this machine is all metal parts versus not metal parts of Bernina. And this one, you can do other things with it, to, you know, but it's a 6700P that I have. And I love this machine. It's not loud, which I really appreciate because my little singer talent, it was so loud. Okay, what do I want to use next to this one? What was the first sewing machine you ever had? So, oh my gosh, it was a singer, but it wasn't a talent. It was a machine that was like in between what my mom had and the talent. It was like a $250 machine or something mm -hmm. way back then because I was making my girls dresses. And um, I made a dress for myself because we took family photos where all of us girls had the same uh, color dresses on. And almost nearly the same style. But then when I moved to Greenland, I had to give up that machine because I couldn't use it over here because the power source is different. Ah. And um, so I bought, well, I saw the little singer inside Brucen, and I'm like, hey, honey, look, it's a singer saw machine. I think I want to buy that one. And it was that little singer talent. And for a while it was fine. But after a while, I realized that I could not be piecing all the time on it because it didn't like me piecing on it. It would always try to eat my half square triangles in that little hole on it. It uh -huh. would just push it all through there. And it's frustrating when you're trying to sew half square triangles and it's doing that. Oh, gosh. Don't I know that? So, you know, when my husband told me, you know, why don't you look for a machine? And while I was in Denmark, I went to the shop in person to look at her machines. And when I came back, I told him, I said, I want this one. And I told him, I said, the lady told me that if we waited till December, she was going to be putting this particular machine on sale and we could save a couple thousand kroners because of it. And we did. Mm -hmm. By by US conversion, I actually I actually only paid eighteen hundred for this one. Oh in US dollars. Bad. 
In the U.S., they're selling them for three thousand U.S. dollars. Mm. So I got a good deal with it. Yeah, that's a good steal. Yes, indeed. So I'm not going to complain. I want. After going through all the hop shops or the shop hops down in Florida, we did 45 of them. I have to say that it, you know, it gave me a chance to see all different kinds of machines and stuff. And I had been thinking about, I want to buy another Janome as a second machine because I've had this one four years and it hasn't been serviced because we don't have a local service. I will have to pack it up in a box and send it to Denmark. And if I do that, I have no way of sewing, and it can be six to eight weeks before I see my machine. So I need to buy a backup. So I've been looking at all of them, and I got the chance to see the M17, which, oh, my God, that's so pricey. Yeah. Um, It's like the price of it's dropped down to, I think, it's weird because one shop was selling it for 20 grand while another shop was selling it for 12 grand. 20,000? Wow. Yeah, 20,000 US dollars. Yeah. But when I looked at the M8, which is the next in line from the M7, um, the neck is a little bit longer than my 6700P. And um, it also... This M8 is now coming with a stitch regular uh, regulator mm -hmm. so that you can free motion quilt better with it. Mm -hmm. And um, the price is a little bit, it was up there for a while, but now it's starting to drop down. And I don't know, maybe next year I could think about spending money on one. Maybe. We'll see. It depends on if you know how things go and i should be here all right now let me go back to look at the channel well hi laura she says hello everyone i just got home from a wine tasting and saw ooh. that you were on donnell says oh i love wine Luane <laughs> says there is a guy named bill who puts tiffany sewing videos on and falls asleep to the sound donnell says katie i have a juki hzl f600 and so love it. Came with all the bells and whistles, and it's not loud. Laura says, Dan Donnell, our family doctor invited us, and they were all wines imported from Italy. They were wonderful. Wine from Italy is tasty. Kathy says, I ran my European brother for 10 years here with a transformer. I finally got a baby lock last month with a U.S. plug. And Denise says, does Nikolai ship ever pull into Denmark? If so, could he drop off the machine for you and then have the shop mail it back to you? I There's hadn't thought start. of that. <laughs> that is a good question because they're going into dry dock in May. What, what, no. To take my sewing machine with you on the ship. Really? And... I and you have to send it to Nuke right here, right now. But by the time we get there, I'm, I don't think I'll be, I will be able to get it. Well, I know that, but that's a great idea, though. I hadn't thought of that. It hadn't occurred to me you could do it like that, but I don't know how much trouble that would be because it still would have to be flown to Nuke. And there's that. It's not, not easy getting out of this country. All right, what color do we want to use now for that two points? Let's use this color. so happy that I have all these scraps of batiks. <laughs> uh oh, I just knocked some on the floor.
All right, let's get these cut. Sylvia says rolls are shaped and I'm back. So what do you guys, what time is it anyway? 9.30, almost 9.30. So we've been going almost two hours. Wow, time flies. <laughs> yep. Time flies when you're sewing. Yep, especially when you're having fun. Exactly. I <laughs> I really enjoy sewing with uh, uh, people. It's it's more relaxing and less stressful, except it when technology is acting out. Yeah, I can relate to that. And it's always right before a Zoom meeting or a live that I have something go wrong. <laughs> yeah, I hear you on that. I've gotten where you know I've gotten where I can get it up for the most time, you know, up and running. But I still sometimes make a mistake or something, and it doesn't come up. And then I'm like, oh my god! <clears throat> but Sean will tell you I'm I'm not messaging him near as often. Like, help! No. <laughs> I don't know what I did wrong. And then he'll come in and have a look and figure out what I did wrong. You know. Um, and we fix it, and then we're off and running again. But I really hate it when it happens right at the beginning of a live, and you're like, I don't, and you know, or the biggest problem that I have these days is when I try to use the, try to show something on the other camera, and then uh -huh. it does, they can't see it, which is, I'm not sure if it's some setting that I've done. I don't know. As long as I don't mess with the camera, it's fine. They can see what I'm doing. But if you want to like get up closer with it or something, that's when I run into this problem. Son of a bitch. Did, did uh -oh. you hear that? <laughs> oh. Sorry. Pardon my language. I'm in the middle of a game. Got my third block done. Now let's trim it. It's too long. Okay. Really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, must be getting killed. He's been trying to play the Star Trek game, but he keeps having trouble with it. Stuff, okay. Something wrong with the server or something. That's not, it's not, the, it's not that. It's uh, Warpath. Oh, that one? That'll be the only time you ever hear him getting feisty. 
Okay, number three. Yay. You're getting a lot of ads, Lewayne. Uh-oh. I thought I fixed that where that shouldn't happen. I do know that when I was watching someone's video the other day, he had 30 ads in his two-hour video. It was like something had gone wrong with YouTube. Let me look and see what's going on, you guys. It shouldn't be happening because I told it not that I wanted to manually claim where I wanted it. Which means you don't have to do anything to it when you do that. I'm pretty sure I turned that off. I usually have to fuss around with that. You do or you don't? I do. Because even if you tell YouTube, um, I just kind of find that YouTube just kind of does what it does. Yeah, sometimes we have no control of any of this. Yeah. Oh, I see what happened. It's me that caused it this time. I forgot to turn something off. Okay, I just did. Robin said she's seen three. Okay, I went in there and turned the setting off. Let's see if it fixes it or not. What game is Nikolai playing? What did you call that game again? What? What's the name of the game again? Warpath. Uh, he's playing Warpath, Kathy. No, 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 this one? Whichever one you were fussing with. Uh, this one's uh, Command and Conquer. Oh, it's Command and Conquer. I love the background chatter, laugh out loud. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny hearing Nikolai in the background. <laughs> Denise says, That's love, Katie. Katie, you're, you're welcome here if he... If he's at you. No, he's not at me. He's at that thing. <laughs> Candace says <laughs> yes a lot. I'm sorry about the ads, you guys. Question. When you make string blocks on paper, do you sew all the way around the block to stabilize it before you take it off the paper? I do not. I know some people do, but I don't usually have a problem with that. Um, the reason why you would want to sew around, around the block is just to make it stay stitched because... When it is off the paper, uh, a lot of these string blocks will tend to kind of stretch and distort over time. So, but I don't have a problem with that. If it does distort, I can usually re-square it to the size that I need it to be. And most of the times when I'm, well, these days, when I'm using up these string blocks, I'm kind of cutting it down to a certain size anyway, or I'll make like a half square triangle out of it. So this is not going to be my final block it's going to be part of a another block but i do know that um doing like a stitch around the the perimeter or doing like what they call a stay stitch does help to prevent it from stretching and distorting but again personally i just don't do that all right let me see here. What do I want to use for a sitter? Let's use this dark purple. And then, it might not be long enough. Well, it's long enough, just barely, but it's long enough. Are you guys enjoying the live tonight? Or is Eric can you, Candace, want, Candace wants to know if you can use any kind of language. Uh, uh, <laughs> any kind of paper. <laughs> oh, my gosh. My tongue is all over the place tonight, looks like. <laughs> um. LeWayne wants to know what language he's fussing in. I said in English. <laughs> he rarely use, It's funny with him. I'll tell you a funny little thing. Sometimes when we go to town, we're shopping together, you know, or doing whatever, and we'll get stopped by several people. And one person will be talking to him in Greenlandic. One person is talking to him in Danish. And then there's me talking in English. 
And he sits there and switches between the three languages like it's nothing. Wow, that's talent. And I'm I'm like, I don't know how he does it because you don't even see a hesitation. He'll just go from one to the next to the next. Every now and then when I hit when he's gaming and I'm in there watching TV, I'll hear him say something in Greenlandic. But most of the time it's usually in English. <laughs> Janice says that Nikolai, she says, I am. I think Nikolai stole the show. Well, what just that? It was a uh, that you made a minute ago. <laughs> They're having fun at your expense. See, there's, you know, he's a happy-go-lucky guy all, for the most part. But certain games make him feel really, I don't know, annoyed. That's the word he calls it. He says it's not anger. Yeah, sometimes really when I get happened. into something, I get frustrated, and yeah, the colorful language does come out too. <laughs> so, I well, can here's a funny one that. for. Yep, here's a funny one for you. Um, I don't. I think I was cooking or something, and something happened in here, and I used a really colorful phrase. He heard it. And he comes in there and he says. <laughs> Did I just hear what I thought came off your mouth? I said, oh, you mean this? And I repeated it. And he says, yeah, that I've never heard you use that kind of language. And he could see that I was really aggravated about something. I was having trouble with something. I don't know. Maybe I burned it or I don't know, something. And Because I don't remember what I was doing that day. But I know I was in the kitchen. And he says, I have never heard that kind of language come out of your mouth. I only use that language when I get aggravated. Or something pisses me off really bad. Uh huh. You know, sometimes we all we all have our moments. Yep, we do. Nikolai says, "No, I'm sorry." Denise says, "I'm currently using MSQC ten inch squares. I have used paper from apartment books." Looking for my new apartment to move to, which I don't think they make anymore. Oh, Donnell's king. It makes me, makes him feel flustered. Yeah, that's it, Donnell. Mm -hmm. uh, Candace says, my son sounds like he's in a military war room when he's <laughs> playing games with friends online. Oh, I bet he does make lots of noise. <laughs> and then Michelle says, I enjoy this very much. They are pretty blocks and I was out and missed the beginning. We went to dinner with the two daughters and son-in-law, and I'll watch at the beginning later. Okay, well, um, yeah, if you want to re-watch the beginning, that would be good because I made some announcements. Oh, speaking of announcements, you guys, June, I forget which, I want to say June the 2nd, is the first, the day, a year ago, June the 2nd, which June's not here yet, I dropped my first quilty video on June the 2nd, 2023. So June the 2nd, 2024 is approaching, which means it'll be one year yeah. since I started doing quilty videos. So I've been thinking about what I can do about my first anniversary. Technically, if you go look at my About Me on the YouTube, it says that I started this channel in March, but no, I didn't. I set, up the I set it up, and I called it Living Greenland to start with, but I didn't have any videos on it. I started putting videos on it. Let's see. I started it in March, but I didn't put the first Greenland video up until May. Uh-oh. I just sewed two of these on here at the same time. Uh-oh. 
Oh, here comes, here comes the scene ripper. I don't know how I didn't notice that. That would have created a really thick block. I've done that a few times. Yep. Have you done the Cotton Cuts PMQ at all? Uh, I tried to do one of them. I couldn't keep up with it, so after a while I just gave up on it. So you have an unfinished one at your house? Yeah. In which I think I just took the extra pieces and made it something else out of it. Oh, okay. Oh my gosh, Nora has a cold tongue. Oh. She's over here licking my ankle. Trying to get my attention, I think. She's whining like, mm, Mom, I want something. I bet I know what she wants. It's 9.30 and nobody's fed her yet. He must be having trouble with the game over there. <laughs> He's been trying to switch his uh, all of his stuff over to a new laptop, and that um, hasn't been easy either. Oh, that's always a nightmare. Yeah, I've tell done me that about a few it. Just, the, the, these laptops that we bought for as replacements. Right. I just clipped the wrong thing. Dang it. Did you get killed? Uh, I don't know, try to... oh. Sorry, babe. He's quit for a little bit, taking a break. Try my best to fight it all, but they keep coming and coming and coming again. Like I, I have not enough money for it. <laughs> You taking a peek at it, babe? Oh boy. It had is it okay? Be right back, Eric. You get to entertain sure. for a minute. Okay. All righty. Now, I don't know if anybody's been noticing, but when you get to the corners here, this gray triangle, you know when you square up or when you make um, like a snowball or when you snowball a corner of a block, you have to cut these triangles off. I saved those triangles for situations like this where you just need a little piece to get over that foundation. And these triangles are the perfect fit for that. So we'll sew a triangle on. Okay. And let me flip this one off. And let me sew on this little piece of fabric there. And that triangle just covers that mm -hmm. one little last bit perfectly. Instead of sewing a whole strip of fabric there. So whenever you're snowballing your blocks and you got those little triangle cutoffs, save them if you want to make string clips or string pieces like this. Those triangles come in very handy when you get to those corner pieces. Kathleen, we are working on string blocks. Eric, you going to QuiltCon 2025 in Phoenix? 
it's up in the air right now. More than likely, if I land in anywhere or if I move to anywhere in Arizona, I'll probably go. But it's still up in the air. I know people are going to try and encourage me to go. <laughs> Remember what state you said you lived in? I live in California right now, but looking to move oh. out. I've been seeing a lot of people moving out of California. My son moved to Georgia from California. Oh, he must love it there. <laughs> no, he moved from California to Georgia. Uh -huh. Can't afford to He can't support him and his son in California. Yeah, it's just getting kind of crazy expensive here. Yep. I know the last time I was there, I couldn't believe how expensive it was. Crazy, insanely expensive. Yeah. And Florida isn't much better these days. Robin. If we were to move to the United States, I wouldn't move back to Florida. I want to live in a state that's more friendly to all people. Bob and Thread got a little bit unwound on me. Uh -oh. up. That's your bobbin making that noise? No, that's the hand wheel. Oh, okay. okay there we go. Kathy says, I'm going. It's down the road from me. Florida is too hot, says Candace. Sylvia says, I'm from California. No, I can't go back to live, but only visit. Yeah, I don't want to live in California yeah. either. Uh, my, tri my small triangles go into an old fishbowl. That's what uh, Denise said. And Michelle says, that's a great idea for the triangles. Robin says Florida is awesome. Yeah, it is, but I realized that it's not conducive for me to live there again because that's the reason my asthma was so crazy. It's not a state for asthmatics. Because of the humidity? Yep, apparently it's the humidity is this problem. Oh. You know, I my asthma's been bad my entire life, and when I reached adulthood, that's when it started trying to really kill me, especially between the months of no, uh, October to March is usually when it was at its worst. Mm -hmm. And I live over here and, you know, since I've been living over here, outside of when I've caught the, the influenza, you know, just normal not being sick stuff, I really don't have as much trouble with it. But... There's always a but. But because I've had pneumonia seven times in my adult life, it's damaged my lungs. So my lung capacity has dropped all the way down to 63% now. Wow. So they're they're saying I'm on the border what they consider to be not only an asthmatic, but... COPD is now being added on. And I'm like, great, just what I wanted to hear. <laughs> Which that means it's serious. It could, you know, over time end up taking my life anyway. 
So I try to be as proactive with my asthma as I can. And I try to not, not do anything that can put me in a position where I end up with pneumonia, which is hard to avoid these days because influenza seems to be the big thing that causes my pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And lucky for us, I haven't had COVID. Neither one of us have. Well, but I sure do catch the flu real easy. Consider that a blessing because I know about a dozen people that caught COVID more than once. <laughs> I think it's a blessing for sure because I probably could have been one of those in the percentage of people who died from COVID. And I don't want to be one of them. No. Not when I can do everything I can to avoid, avoid it, you know. And while I was in Raleigh, I got sick. Well, I had been there since Monday, the you know, February the 19th. And then um, Saturday, when my, my daughter finally arrived up there, when we went out to eat at um, Cheesecake Factory. And, you know, I hadn't had any sniffles or anything after being in, you know, going to QuiltCon and meeting so many people and stuff. You know, and I tried to be as mindful as I could be about how close I was to people. I did hug a few people, but not an excessive amount of people. And I made uh -huh. sure that they didn't I didn't see them coughing or sneezing, or I wouldn't have went I wouldn't have went within a mile of them, you know. And um but I think it was a combination of us. It was raining when we went. I got cold. And then we went in and we had to wait an hour and a half to get in to eat. So some of the time I was sitting, I sat for a little while out in the more open space where it wasn't so many people. But then at one spot I was standing or sitting in the hallway too. But when we went into the restaurant, oh my God, there was so many people, you guys. Mm -hmm. It was just in, insanely crowded. And when we got, when we left, we had come through Belks to get to Cheesecake Factory, which means we traveled the entire length of the store. So we came in on the side door. And when we left Cheesecake Factory, Belks was closed. Wow. And so we went out this side door and it's still raining outside. And I only had my little lightweight sweater. I didn't bring a jacket with me. And it ended up, she couldn't find her car. And um, so she said, you need to stand right here in this light and I'm going to go see if I can find a car. And she called her husband. So she had him on the phone talking to her while she was looking. And a young couple came out the same door we came out of. And they, they, they asked me, do you know if there's another door to Belks? And I got to looking at Belks and all of the parking lot because they were parking, what do you call them? Parking... Garage. There's levels of, yeah, like a parking garage. It has levels on it. Mm -hmm. And I've got to look at it. I'm like, wait a minute. There's another one at the other end of Belks across the road because I was across the road from Belks. And um, I realized, yes, there is another door because of where, where I was looking. And Lynette was on her way back. And I, and I said, hey, stop. And she stopped. And I pointed to the, parking garage across the road. I said, I bet your car's in there. <laughs> so she turned around and went back the other way and went down to the end of belts. Sure enough, that's where the car was at. But uh, we got disor we got disoriented because we didn't go back through belts. We came out a side door. And that that basically messed up, you know, where she thought the car was at. And so by the time we got in the car, I got in the car, I was freezing. And then that, then her and Christine told me that they heard me coughing during the night. And I had already started coughing like an hour after we got home, back to the Airbnb. And mm -hmm. I, I, I felt like I was a, a little bit, I don't know, I didn't feel good. And I coughed all night. The next day was Sunday. 
And I was going to go back to QuiltCon, but since I had that cough, I decided, nope, I think I might be sick, so let's not. And we decided to go ahead and make the drive to Lake City. And by the time we got to Florida, I had a full-blown sky-high fever that was causing me to have chills. And I was really sick. And then within a day after I came down with whatever it was I had, Lynette was sick too. So we oh, think God. we picked it up from the Cheesecake Factory. Pretty sure that's where it came from. That's scary. And I mean, I, and you go out in public and you don't know what other things you're going to pick up from just people being innocent and just, you know, giving you a hug, giving you a handshake. I really don't think that I caught it from FootCon because I didn't see anybody really sick in there. I, I don't even think I heard a person coughing. And I would that would have sent me going the other way, you know? Right, right. I think I caught it from the restaurant. And it was aggressive enough. It probably was aggressive because I was already run down. You know, flying and all of that takes... You know, it can take a toll on you. Yeah, it can weaken you. Yeah. And since you and when you have an immune system like mine, you know, it makes you prone to catching everything that comes along. Which sucks. I keep hearing a telephone go or a it's my oh it's you that's going off. Okay, I just need to find another dark purple for that other end. Something happened here where I don't have me. Yeah, it's not light enough. Darn it. Oh, here's another piece. This might work. Go through these pieces of scraps and you always find what you need. <laughs> yeah, scraps are valuable. Yep. At least in my world. I think uh, the quilt is, the quilt top I'm working on this for Becca and Tiffany and Ian. That one's up. The background is not scraps, but all of the colorful uh, strips, those are all uh, scraps from my scrap box. Wow. Because I had like had made strips strips of on something else. So I'd leftover strip sets. And uh, that's what I used for this. They were all long enough. All right, we got this last one on here. All right. So I do see Candace Zimanoff's question, what kind of machine does Eric have? Uh, this is, again, it's a Juki DDL uh, 5550. It is an industrial grade machine. So it's what you would see in like one of the factories, um, dare I say, <laughs> one of the sweatshops. But it's not your regular home sewing machine. It does come on a big uh table and you have to take the table with the machine because the two kind of go together you can't take one and not have the other so but the cost of this machine now is less than a thousand dollars um which is way cheaper than your regular home sewing machine these days so it's something to kind of take a look at if you're looking for like an industrial grade machine this might be one that you want to want to consider Although it has its limitations because it doesn't have all the bells and whistles, like there's no, there's not even a thread cutter on this machine. So that's why you see me sewing scraps or you see me sewing through like a leader ender kind of project um, on any of my videos. Uh, so just keep that in mind. It doesn't have the same bells and whistles that some of us have become accustomed to. 
a no thread cutter. I'm lucky this thing can backstitch because a lot of industrial machines don't have that feature. Um, but there's a lot of positives to, to it too. It does so, sorry. What's impressive about this machine is it does do 5,000 stitches in a minute. And if you're a speed sewer, yeah, you can basically zip through a whole quilt block in no time. <laughs> so. Okay, so, so Kathy Smith says, my oldest daughter left LA when she, when her lease expired during COVID. Acting isn't centered in LA anymore, so she can live anywhere. Mm -hmm. Said she's never moving back. Then when Wayne said, my last bout of pneumonia in 2008 almost killed me. My doctor said I was like one to three weeks dying when I got into his office. Kathleen says, thank you. Do you have a pattern? Are you talking about for the string block, um, Kathleen? Eric, when do you want to go? Um, California? I'm going to square up these blocks and then we can call it. Uh, oh, Kathleen where do I want ask to go? That. Um, where do you want to go? Right now, it's looking that I am either going to Las Vegas or somewhere in Arizona. Those are the two states um, that have the most opportunities for what I'm, or the type of job that I'm looking for. So, what am I going anywhere Did else? You, California is out of control, and its states. And it's a state that is crazy. Florida is no better. We are moving to, let's see, Emmy is Michigan, right? In the abbreviation Emmy, Michigan, or is that Maine? I, no, Michigan is M-I, I believe, so it might be Maine. And then Christine said, yeah, Christine was there with me when I got sick. So she says, yep, definitely caught something from that cheesecake factory. Because she, we all shared an Airbnb house together. We each had our own bedroom. And oh. she was the only one not sick. So I'm pretty sure that that's what it was. Uh, Kathleen says, can you do long exercises? I don't know, Kathleen. I don't know what that means. What, at Kathleen... What is crazy about it? Asked Lil Wayne. And then Candace says, thanks, Eric. Eric, do you have a quilting foot for that machine? There is no there quilting is no foot quilting. for this machine. Um, it just comes with your regular standard sewing foot. Uh, there's a few other different types of sewing feet that you can purchase for it, but it's more geared towards people who are doing fashion, uh, dressmakers, uh, hand sewers, that sort of, sort of stuff, but not a lot of accessories that can go along with this particular machine. Again, the machine was built for the fashion industry or for, for factories and not really built for quilters, although it is good for quilt piecing. So that's what I use it for, but um, not a lot of accessories or not a lot of bells and whistles that go with this machine. I'm trimming up this fourth block now. All right, here's number four. Ooh, I love the blue and purple colors. Thank you. Okay, so I got four made, but I bet you have eight made, don't you? <laughs> you can tell who's the faster sewer. Well, you're measuring and cutting where I'm just sewing. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to uh, re you know use the colors more than once yeah. of those big strips, and I only I only cut them down to one and one and a quarter is all I did. 
except for the very end ones. The end ones have to be bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think it is now ten o'clock. So we've been going eight nine. We've been going three hours. Wow, that's a long time. Okay, so while Eric's finishing up, you're finishing up a block, right? Yep. While you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and show them the fabric that I'm going to use for the plan to sew along. They only saw it with it all. Uh, they only saw it with the plastic still on it, so you can't really see what it looked like. So I'm going to give them a quick show and show and tell kind of, and show them the background as well. Okay, so for that so long that I was talking to you about the raspberry kisses block um remember i showed you this in um the other day but i didn't take it out of the plastic but i'm going to take it out and show you all the colors but i have cut two yards of this this is what i'm going to use for the background it's just cotton and this uh fabric bundle is by qt fabrics and it's called Ombre Scroll is the name of the uh, fat quarter bundle and there's 30 fat quarters in this thing I'm probably not going to use any of the, the these lighter colors and I'll show you those in just a second so I'm going to go ahead and get the ribbon off alright oh that so, is pretty I've had this one for a while. So here's the first one. Oh. Whoa, that was lucky. This is the second one. Here's the next one. See, we're going to get a bit of a rainbow of colors. Wow. Here's the next one. Kind of like an ombre style almost, you know, mm -hmm. if you use all the colors in the it, that's in it. Here's the next one. Oh, I like that. Yeah, me too. Here's a really nice one, too. Look at this one. It's like purple and it has a little bit of a certain, I'm not sure, I guess you could say that might be sea foam green, maybe. Mm -hmm. And pretty. then there's this dark blue, looks like blue with black in it. Purple. I'm going to have fun getting all these creases out of this fabric. Because <laughs> I've had this bundle for a long time. Maybe two years. Wow. I was saving it for something that I thought, you know, I'm like, I'll save it until some pattern speaks to me on what I can use it for. And when I saw these little... This pattern we're doing this called Raspberry Kisses. I saw that at the pattern already made at QuiltCon. And I'm like, this needs to be our next project together to sew together. Because when I looked at it, it's so simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not that much goes into it. You sew um, squares to a rectangle. And then in order to put it on point, you have to put what you do a uh, square in a square style. And that's oh. all you got to do. And then you just sew all of the box together. Here's the next color. That sounds simple enough. Yeah. There's not too much to it. And you and I'm, you know, you could basically use a fat quarter or you might be able to get away with using charm pack. Except for the background anyway. Oh, that's a pretty purple. Yes, it is. Then it lightens up. Check this out. You go to a lighter purple. 
you know, and the camera's going to probably make it look like it's pink. It's not. It's lilac. Now we're switching to what looks like maybe a salmon color, kind of, possibly. It looks more pink by the camera. Yeah. Then a pink. Christine says, I want that machine, but bought a different Juki in 2020. <laughs> There's this red, like a burgundy oh, red. I don't know if it's just me or if it's me just getting older, but my taste in certain colors have been changing a lot. In yeah. which years ago, I would not have liked that red, but now that I now that I'm a lot older. I love that darker color, brownish, more maroon color red. Yep. You would have never, I, 20 years ago, I wouldn't be sewing red into anything. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, I have come to like red. <laughs> yeah. I tend to think it's because I live over here and any bits of color that you get from sunsets and northern lights and flowers in the spring. I mean, there's all kinds of things that happen. Mm -hmm. It makes me realize how much I love color, but my color use was being used in the garden instead and not inside our house. Because I spent a big majority of my time when I wasn't taking care of kids or going to school or um, my other myriad of duties that was required <laughs> of me um, as a wife. You know, I was outside escaping reality. I had a gift and I went with it. I had a dream, but that died. <laughs> I wanted to, seriously, I, my dream was to own my own plant nursery and run it. But I kept being told, you're a woman, you can't do that kind of thing. Women are supposed to stay home and raise their kids and blah, blah, blah. Did what I was raised to do. Well, that's a nice green. Yeah, actually, it is. I don't mind this green. This one's nice. This no. next green is nice too. It should make a, a fun little quilt, though. I think with if I use all the colors except for the very end ones. And then here's another green, a little bit darker than the one I just showed you. So you're just going to have this myriad of color. Christine, I'm going to make that, that so long that I've been talking about that we're going to be doing together. Those that want to participate in it. And anyway, is I'm going to be making these out of that fabric. Ooh, pretty. Yep. Um, I don't know if there's a picture... There is a picture of a pillow that you can see how the setup is. But I saw this fully made. Christine, do you remember QuiltCon seeing a big a quilt hanging in? Uh, can't remember the name of the quilting company, but they had a quilt made that had white background with all the colorful square uh, X's on it. Do you remember seeing that? Because that's mm. where I got this idea to do this for our next sew along. Sorry, I'll be right back. There's somebody knocking at my front door. Okay. There's this color green. Sylvia says, my partner is home, so I'm off to have a good evening. Have a good night. Christine says, beautiful fabric. What are you making with it? And Kathleen says, Maine, probably to my question about ME. And Luane says, I am getting that way. Used to hate purple, but now starting to accept it. I don't know why people dislike purple so much. 
well, I don't see what's there to, to not like about it. I think this might be a black. Okay, so the rest of these colors in here are browns and grays and off-whites, and I'm probably not going to use any of those. I'm, I don't even think I'm going to use the black. So what I might do with these is give them as a gift, a, uh, a drawing, because I'm sure there's somebody in this channel that likes using blacks, browns, and tans. Anyway, I'll show these one at a time so you can see them. Okay, sorry about that. So I'll have to find someone that likes these colors. So these are the colors I'm not going to use. Yep, there you go. Those are the ones I'm not going to use. Hmm. And I'm pretty sure that's a black. Yep, so there's the black one too. I want to keep it all colorful with this vivid stuff like this, you know. Did you see that green? Look at that. Oh, that's a nice dark colored green. Yeah, it is. So that's what I'm going to use for our sew along. And don't forget, next weekend, we're going to, I ha, I think what I'm going to do is, um, those of you who are going to participate, try to have what you can have cut and ready to go. Okay. And then we will just start by sewing the blocks, the, the X part first. And then the next Saturday, we'll do the square and a square. And then the Saturday after that, we'll go ahead and start sewing these blocks in rows. Now, keep in mind, you want to you decide on what size quilt you're going to make and go from there. I don't have a set size I'm going to make. I have to sit down and think about it first. So this is another design on the fly as you go thing. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sorry I have been so quiet, Katie. Been cleaning my sewing room as it looks like Tornado and Hurricane both had a fight in here. Uh-oh. <laughs> Suzanne says, those are perfect colors to make a quilted vest to wear with black pants and any other colors as a top. Oh, you're, you have a point there, Suzanne. Oh. So I'm sure I bet I could find somebody who might want these. All right. Does anyone else have any questions they want to ask Eric? Ask away. <laughs> Speak now or forever hold your peace. So let me show all the strings that I got done while we were on here. Yeah, show them. Yeah, show them your blocks. I want them to see that too. There's the first one. That was the one I took the paper off of. And you'll see a lot of repeating fabrics because I just don't, I'm not one of those people who say that you can't have the same fabric on a scrap quilt in the same block. So I'm not one of those people. Well, that's um, good because you're just using them. I reused the, some of the same colors again on all of them. Yep. The idea is to use up the scraps, right? Mm-hmm. Now, one thing I do like to do, you'll see it better on this particular block, but right there, that triangle piece in the corner yep. is actually a crumb, uh, piece of crumb fabric that I was starting, but then I just decided not to go with it, and I saw that it could fit on that corner. So a lot of times I will do things like that. On this particular block, I actually started with a piece of crumb um, I think Karen Brown calls it crumb tape or she, where she sews on like adding machine tape and she sews all those oh, little crumb yeah. pieces on there. I started with that. And because it is a strip, you can use it in a string block and just build it out that way. So um, if you ever make those adding machine tape 
pieces and you want to figure out a creative way of doing it, hey, throw it in a string block. That's a great idea. Yep. And I got these, I think these were the first two that we did or that I did on here. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Not bad. Be told I guessed right. <laughs> you did four more than I did. That was a good guess. Well, it's not the speed at which you go. It's did you enjoy the process? That's what I'd say. Yes, I was enjoying myself. I have nothing to complain about. Uh, Denise says, you never know when you might want to quilt want to quilt a quilt of nature with those colors in the way like the whale, the rocks and the water. Yeah, you, yeah, you're right. I hadn't thought of that. And Robin says, Eric, your blocks are awesome. Laura says, Eric, Thank your you. blocks are beautiful. June says, I can't see your blocks, Eric. <laughs> Here's so a try showing them. Here, let me. Wait, wait. Hang on. Let me put that. Come on. Give me. That's kind of weird. Hang on, you guys. Something's wrong here. It's not letting me spotlight that one. I wonder why. Can you show me your big your uh, the screen that has your face in sure. it? Hang on, let me spotlight you though first. Whenever Zoom decides to let me do it. Oh, I bet I know what the problem is. Hang on, you guys. <laughs> Fabric laying on the keyboard. There we go. I'm going to spotlight you. Okay, now you can show it. So we got that one. Oh. That's two. Oh. Three. Four. Five. Six. And this is the one with There's your crumb. crumb yeah. Key. There in the middle. That is so cool. Seven and eight. Awesome. And eight. <laughs> Eric, what time do you do your lives? I, I try I to do catch them. them, but sometimes I miss them. I'm in Arizona and I always get confused when the time change happens. <laughs> I would, I'm usually on YouTube doing my lives at 7 p.m. or 7.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time uh, every Tuesday night. And once in a great while, I will do a live that's more kind of a impromptu thing on a weekend, maybe like on a Saturday night or a Sunday night, if I'm crafting or sewing something and I just want to turn on the camera. Kathy Klein says, nice blocks. Thank you, Kathy. Denise says, hi, June. How are you this evening? Hi, June. How are you? June says, your blocks are very pretty. Oh, thank you. Okay. So is there anyone else that wants to ask Eric any questions? Because I think we're about to jet off of here. We've been on here for three hours. I can never escape getting past shorter than three hours. I don't know why that is. <laughs> Talk too much and not enough sewing, maybe. I don't know. That's not Anyhow. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyhow, I appreciate all of y'all coming to my live today. And um just a reminder, let me mention it one more time. First of all, uh don't forget to go to Eric's channel if you are not a subscriber please go over there and subscribe to his channel and watch his videos and like them so that he can help his channel out i'm thank sure you, he would you. appreciate it thank any you help any of us gets from y'all is a good thing um let's see suzanne says i like the box behind eric too yeah, i do too i agree with you 
And Denise says, thank you for the visit. We'll go back and watch the beginning. Okay, now the reminder is April 23rd is a sew and chat with Lou Wayne. 424 is a sew and chat with Karen of Get Her Done. Get It Done or whatever. I'm not exactly sure of the wording. Uh, anyway, it it's done. a big deal with her. I have waited six months to be able to do something with her. And finally, and we met a quilt con, and that really helped break the ice pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, 425 is so chat with Liana of Pastry Queen. 54 is so in chat with Sharice. She is one of the designers of the this year's and one of the past year's Stronger Together uh, quilt along that happened through Fat Quarter Shop. So we're you're going to get to meet another designer. Yay. Um, and then 516 is so in chat with Russ of Quilt Meets World. So that's my setup for other people joining me as we are live. At the end of the month, I will be doing a pre-recorded video of my progress for April and then a separate video of a quarter, it's like a quarter, four months, quarter of everything I accomplished in the four months. And uh, I can tell you right now, I didn't accomplish everything I really wanted to accomplish, but I had that long trip in the middle of all of this. So that's why. Also, don't forget 427, have your fabric ready to go for our so long. And thank you so much for coming to watch us on the live. Thank you, Eric, for coming and sewing with me as well. Oh, thank and you for having me. Anything else you want to say before we close this out? No, just thank you for everybody for watching. And again, thank you, Katie, for inviting me to this. And thank you for being so patient with my scheduling, because I know we were trying to schedule this since last November, if I remember correctly. But we finally got this. So I'm glad that I got a chance to finally talk to you in person or sort of in person on Zoom. Um, hopefully one of these days we will actually meet in person, maybe at a court con somewhere. Yeah, I hope so, because I would really like to meet you, too. Um, Christine, I will post the schedule on uh, my community page within the next day, along with over on my uh, Facebook group called Greenland Quilter, both of those. And Laura says, by the way, Eric, I love not only your quilting videos, but your crafting as well. <laughs> oh, thank you, Laura. <laughs> Okay, everybody, thank you for coming to the live. Make sure you live, laugh, love, and dream. And out of that, create something beautiful. Love you guys and see you on the next go around. All right, let me stop the live. Don't hang up on Zoom yet. All right. Okay.